Okay, can people hear me now? Okay, so I'm very, very sorry. I had um, forgotten my Elgato, uh, which means I couldn't attach my streaming computer, so I had to design an entire <laughs> streaming setup uh, uh, for running this short stream tonight. So thank you very much for everyone <laughs> who has been patient enough of the 32 of you uh, to remain. Uh, I think there's uh, 17 still of you uh, who are diehards. Anyway, um, this is a presentation about the Shaq Paranoff generator, and I believe that this work that was conducted in the, in the 1980s by I.M. Shaq Paranoff uh, replicated some of the effects of John Hutchison, the Hutchison effects, and also, uh, by extension, Lena effects. And I, given the fact that it is producing forms of ball lightning, which uh, Ken Shoulders says is exotic vacuum objects. What you can see on the screen here is a luminous object uh, of the ball lightning type. And uh, this one here of uh, the uh, zero albedo black type here. Right, so thank you, Gordon, for uh, your happy birthday. Hi, Rhett. Hi, DAY projects with Chuxis. Ron Muckle, David Boutlier, Gordon Doherty, Cosmic Dave, great to have you all here. D2105K, uh, David uh, Artifact, um, who else we've got? Tucker, uh, EBB, uh, Ken Pratt, great to have you here. Great to have you here. Stephen Halls. So thank you very much for joining me this Sunday evening, the 15th of January. Hi, Elias. Great to have you here as well. So uh, this might be a complete mess, uh, this presentation. Uh, I have a separate camera, which I might be able to bring up here now. Uh, no, that's not doing that, is it? Uh, that would do that, wouldn't it? Um, uh, dear, this is going to be painful. I don't know if you can see my mugshot now. Anyway, I'm going to kill that overview there. Um, and uh, we'll see what you're seeing right here. Now that is my mugshot, and hello, there I am. I'm sorry, it's just the uh, camera in the uh, computer, so it probably looks a little bit smooth. Okay, hi Steve, great. Okay, so uh, it's quite quiet, is it? Okay, I don't know whether I can bring the microphone closer. Hello microphone, is this louder? Um, <laughs> uh, that's maybe what I can do there. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, back to the uh, presentation. Uh, okay, I don't know what you're seeing right now. You're having slow signal with occasional lags on 5G connection. Oh no. <laughs> okay, right, okay, I see what it's saying. Um, it's saying the current resolution is 3840 by 2160. Oh dear, um, oh dear, that's probably why the wrong resolution I'm going to I'm going to try can I fix this Yeah, I need to change the video resolution. I'm not sure I can do that on the fly. Uh, this might be a complete disaster. So, let me just see what's going on there. It's better, hopefully. I don't know whether this is going to be better. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm really sorry. So what was happening was the uh, the temporary streaming setup I had to set up because I didn't have a piece of equipment with me and I had to put my streaming computer to one side was uh, broadcasting in 4K and that was causing problems. So uh, I hope that this will be better now and I should be able to switch between uh, this one. Uh, here, which is my second screen with my mugshot on it and the uh, screen without my mugshot on it. So I'm going to show you uh, 
this. I'm moving for a start. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is the Shaq Poronoff generator, which we're going to be talking about a little bit today. Uh, this is not going to be, as you can already see, <laughs> highly imperfect presentation. Um, but uh, as I was trying to say before, things got a bit sticky. Uh, the luminous uh, blob on the left here uh, is one type of object that they created. And the black blob here with this what I call a zero albedo is another type of uh, object and both of these are a form of exotic vacuum objects. They are ball lightning and uh, they are much more. So uh, we're going to look into that now and I'm going to correlate it uh, with several other things. Now what happened was, if I can find the relevant uh, uh, blog article here in a second if you just give me a second I can't I can't do funky things like pull things up whilst I've got my mugshot on in this stream <laughs> so it may be all kinds of terrible events going on okay so um, let's see if I can do this so I can uh, switch to my camera <laughs> this is gonna be so painful <laughs> okay all right let's see if that works okay all right <laughs> Oh, this it's going to be an epic, <laughs> terrible presentation for the first uh, of the year. Anyway, we do what we can. Right. So, uh, yeah, the uh, title of this presentation was Shaq Par Paranoff Generator. The uh, more detailed uh, version of that is uh, what I have here, which is investigating and reporting a reported method of producing magnetotoro electrical radiation identified by Alexander Shishkin and his team at Dubna. That's uh, Dubna, about 50, I think, kilometers north of Moscow, uh, where the a lot of the nuclear research was done and still is. And you will find out uh, if you go to your periodic table, which has all the super heavy elements being, uh, um, uh, you know, synthesized. A lot of those were synthesized in Dubna. So these are very serious guys uh, that worked on this. And uh, what we have um, is in a presentation that I um, transcribed and uh, reposted in English and extended in um, sixth of, from 6th of October 2018 that I published in uh, February of the following year. Um, there was a slide, I think it was yeah, slide 11, and it had uh, several different methods by which the team at Dubna under Shishkin were able to develop uh, these type of birdies and strange radiation tracks and so forth. And the, the one that, that, that it was originally uh, came about from was this hydrodynamic generator where he had this uh, uh, sort of... Uh, two discs but one had some uh, grooves cut in, in it and then another one had some tongues cut in it and they went like that and it was for making an uh, oil and water emulsion and uh, he felt a little bit sick around it he put up some x-ray film and they were fogged and uh, then on deep study of the x-ray film they saw these uh, birdie shapes and they saw these pits under the birdie shapes and also other types of tracks um, which we've been seeing as strange radiation tracks. So, of, of course, it's logical that because he was seeing uh, this uh, from a spinning device, that he would then go and attempt to look at other revolving bodies, which he did in all kinds of different materials, span them, I think, 5,000 revolutions per minute in, in cones, and these produced the strange radiation as well. Then he went on to f uh, establish that th this comes from um, materials irradiated with gamma radiation and uh, there was a team uh, by Bogdanovich at Moscow Nuclear Physics Institute and they had the synchrotron uh, this uh, beam line firing into uh, a tungsten let's say conversion target this produced gamma rays uh, and uh, those went through a, a magnet and the magnet um, produced a you know these two birdie types uh one one on one side of one type and one on the other of another type and i've talked about this a number of times so they know it comes from gamma radiation so then the assumption was that if it comes from gamma radiation then gamma sources like uh, cesium-137 and cobalt should be able to produce these things and sure enough they did uh, and this is interesting because radioactive sources were used in the pap device originally to create 
what these are, which are charge clusters, which are in the nascent form and the small form, uh, effectively static electricity. And I will be translating other papers from uh, Shishkin that talks about the accidents at Chernobyl and the accidents at Fukushima and an accident at nuclear waste site uh, in Russia. If I haven't already translated that, I might have translated that. But if I haven't, it's coming up. And uh, of course, uh, John Hutchison in his um, Hutchison effect, he had a, uranite, a uranium or uranite source in there. And that one of the fission products of uranium is 137 cesium. And therefore, these 130, the 137 cesium in there will produce these, uh, what they call uh, in the Shishkin terms, magnetotoro electrical radiation. And then uh, there's also this one where you have this high voltage pulse of uh, plus or minus 590 volts on an X-ray film in an opaque package. And uh, I discussed how this was the same volts per centimeter, approximately, as used to polarize the vacuum in the uh, Hutchison effect. And also, it's the kind of voltage you actually get typically within a cloud from 1945 data. And so uh, the idea that Ken Shoulders had was that if you have a... Um, a cloud and it has these typical sort of around about plus and minus 500 volt uh, swings in there sometimes it can get bigger up to three and a half thousand volt potential in the cloud that that forms a lot of static electricity the static electricity uh, clusters into macro evos the evos then have you know a, a certain amount of charge in them uh, but they're they're like a big big electron uh, and they form like a ball lightning and the ball lightning is then attracted to uh, a higher potential let's say it's the ground in this case or for a cloud to ground discharge and then that travels down and as it travels down it's capturing material ionizing material around it creating an ionized channel it can get overgrown as it were and split and so you get forks in the lightning and uh, Ken Shoulders talks about having one uh, so two, uh, it's splitting into two or uh, potentially three uh, branches, which he replicated in the lab. And I believe that in there, in the core of that, you have the magnetic core, which is a crenellated iron sphere, like the one over that shoulder that we produced, uh, uh, Hank Guren produced in a Vega experiment and that we produced in uh, uh, ultra experiments. And that, that, that then comes down to the ground and then it has an ionized channel through which the discharge from cloud to ground or whatever it is going uh, can occur. So uh, effectively using this understanding, you don't need the uh, whatever it is, it's uh, 30,000 volts per is it centimeter, I, th I think it is, I, I, I was looking at. You don't need this huge amount to break down uh, um, the cloud to ground. You, you have a much lower value because you actually create an a ionized discharge channel. And this is shown in high-speed photography uh, by the the high-speed guys. Uh, you can go and see where they've gone to the uh, the Singapore hotel and they've taken a photo, or, or rather high-speed photography. And you can see something comes down, it hits the ground, and then you have multiple discharges through that ionized uh, channel. I actually took some pictures of that and shared it many moons ago when I first started discussing this. Now also you've got reactor producing corona stream discharges, obviously in... in uh, uh, John Hutchison's work. He regularly had uh, coronas and corona stream streaming going on. So when you actually look at what John Hutchison had, he didn't have a hydrodynamic generator. Uh, he did have spinning things, but I don't think he had anything spinning uh, at this high speed other than um, spinning electromagnetic waves, like circularly polarized type things. Um, but he did have something that produced gamma rays. He did have this level of volts per centimeter. He did have corona stream of discharges. And he didn't have this. Uh, and I didn't really know what this was. And, uh, the, the, and you can't see it because uh, uh, I'm, I haven't got my funky differous thing. So uh, what I'm referring to is he didn't have this Shaq Paranoff, because when I originally translated this, the software that I used to translate it, translated Shaq Poronov, and I couldn't find any information about it. And basically what happened was, uh, uh, last year, uh, there was a uh, presentation uh, given by uh, uh, one of the Russian researchers, and I've given the link here, 
and suddenly I realized what the Shaq Paranoff uh, generator was. And I uh, emailed um, uh, the MFM uh, MFMP volunteers and said, look, I think we should probably be investigating this. And to his great credit, uh, the uh, uh, David Butelier uh, started having a look at this. And uh, recently he's uh, he's obviously had a lot to do with uh, a new newborn in the family and uh, but he, he came back to this a, a few weeks ago and uh, he found some additional documents uh, that we are going to look at briefly today now they are not the best translation uh, I am hoping to do a much better translation and people can work on that what I'm uh, doing putting this out there today is to try and encourage uh, people in the community to find additional documents then uh, just if you add them to the blog on remoteview.icu just add your link and the document uh, and if it's a, a new one that hasn't been identified by anyone else or we don't talk about it today uh, and uh, we try and get a, a load of material together now I have, have actually reached out to the uh, Russians that produced this work and uh, we'll see if we get some feedback from them. Uh, they obviously have access more directly to the people and the institutions uh, that did the original work. So hopefully we can get some better images because a lot of the online images of Shaq Paranel's work are really very poor. They're kind of like photocopies of a black and white copy of a black and white photo that was put in a book somewhere. Typical kind of thing where you get multiple generations and it just looks like a black splodge and you really can't see what's going on. So. Um. <laughs> and, and and Alan's joined us. Hi, Alan. It's great to have you here today. He says he's he's tested testing the magnet glued to the bottom of a glass of Glen Morangi. Yeah, but what what is the uh, um, the uh, Teslas that you've got there? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, essentially. Um, I think this is going to be quite interesting and if we can achieve it and and from looking at the paper I, there's a couple of ideas I have and I hope other people will have ideas out there and share them there are a couple of ideas where we might be able to um, fix what is not uh, happening in uh, the work done by David so far and uh, um, we can then get a process by which we can generate uh, ball lightning on a regular basis and create some of the effects but I warn you, before we go into this, this is, as was noted by uh, um, uh, Shishkin and his research team, a means by which you can produce these monopoles, this uh, strange radiation, this uh, Kozirav Dirac monopoles, as uh, in the terminology of uh, um, uh, Shaq Paranoff. And uh, th that could be harmful. And so, uh, Ideally, you would do this at a great distance or you would do this with the Shishkin uh, um, shielding, which interestingly is very similar to the um, dark light uh, um, uh, material, uh, the, you, the material used by Tesla in the 1880s onwards to project onto using this dark light, this uh, etheric matter. Uh, and he used a, a phosphor, which typically at the time would have been something like zinc sulfide, but strontium aluminate. In fact, I read a paper today, and you can probably go and look this up, where I think last year, uh, late last year, a Japanese team developed a means by looking at the static electric field on a, t a target by using europium doped str strontium aluminate. I don't know whether this came off the patent that was shared in detail at the uh, during last year, um, from Alexander Shishkin. Maybe it was, I don't know, but um, this is the first time I believe that there is a means to observe static electricity intensity um, uh, with a particular piece of uh, uh, sort of visual equipment. Okay, so um, uh, I will talk about that in, a, in, in another presentation. Okay, so uh, what am I going to go and do? I'm going to go and get a, a couple of docs and we're going to read through them. Um, I've highlighted uh, relevant texts in there um, so hopefully this won't be too painful uh, <laughs> oh dear this is a disaster it's the five p's proper preparation prevents poor performance i'm missing a word out in there just to be polite right okay so uh 
So the uh, document which you which I've given a link to in the uh, the um, how should we put this? Is this going to work? Oh, okay, that just doesn't work. Okay, all right. In the uh, blog here is by Dmitry Kolikov, and this was the guy giving the presentation that I gave the link to. And it's replication of experiments on generation of long-lived plasma formation formations by discharge circuits in the form of metallized Mobius strips. Okay, so that is the uh, uh, their replication. They're actually still working on this document. This is March 2022, but they're still doing experiments. So this is the guy that I've reached out to, um, and uh, he's the, the the papers for the Russian conference will be um, submitted and and put into a journal soon so uh, maybe this will form his paper for that or maybe he will have uh, an updated one with new data I don't know we shall see but uh, anyway the article provides a brief description of some previously performed experiments on the generation of long-lived plasma formations as well as strange radiation by discharge circuits in the form of metallized Mobius tapes preliminary results of replication of experiments performed by IM Shakparanov in the second half of the 20th century are presented. The hypothesis of the mechanism of generation of long-lived plasma formations as well as the nature of strange radiation is discussed. So essentially uh, you have this uh, metallized polymer Mobius tape here uh, and uh, this is actually one that's been used. Uh, there is a damaged area down here where some of the tape blew off the aluminium in this case. So in the 80s of the 20th century, some scientific uh, periodicals presented the results of experiments on the generation of long-lived artificial plasma objects, APOs. Now, they, the APO in Shakparanov's work, which we'll have a look in a sec, is referred to as uh, uh, plasmoid objects. Uh, but he did state that he was uh, the jury was out as to whether they were actually a plasma. There was definitely an artificial and it was definitely an object, the P is still in debate, okay? Which is why I think it's quite appropriate that Ken came up with the name exotic vacuum objects. Anyway, these were created using discharge circuits in the form of a Mobius tapes from dielectric materials with metallization applied to them. An example of the manufacturing technology of such circuits, as well as the description of the methods and modes of performing experiments, can be found in the reference too. And so that is kind of what we're going to go to now. And this is a rough translation. Uh, and um, uh, not this one. <laughs> it's uh, this one. And I think actually uh, I, I'm going to go to my overview shot here um, I think I found a better version of this did I or did I not no okay there's some better images in Shaq Paranoff's work in this paper okay so uh, so actually I'm going to go to this reference first uh, and this is the mechanism to uh, of artificial ball lightning generation by undirected Mobius strip circuits and this is Shaq Paranoff again a different spelling here there's lots of different spellings if you actually put this into Deeple or Google Translate his his Russian name you get a number of different uh, suggestions and you, you oh god sometimes I'm, I'm can't do Russian names you stingy if <laughs> They are probably completely destroyed that. Um, and you can see it's a Lominos, uh, Lominos of uh, Moscow State University and a Belgorod Research Group. Okay, so results of our experiments on artificial ball lightning generation are presented. Our first test series obtained luminescent objects resembling, resembling natural ball lightning by radio frequency discharges from a Mobius strip, that is a loop, as non-directed electrical circuit. In the second series of experiments, we obtained dark clots, also similar to ball lightning, observed in nature. The, this paper attempts to elucidate the generation mechanism of luminous or dark atmospheric objects. We explain generation of ball lightning by a new approach to understanding of superconductivity phenomena. So there we go. We've got some expectation of superconductivity there. Okay. 
uh, as antenna for emission and reception of electromagnetic waves at radio frequencies. We find Mobius strips with conducting surface suitable for tracking massive objects in space. Okay, so the introduction, one unsolved problem in the 20th century physics is to clarify the nature of ball lightning. Many works address this question, which however uh, did not lead to unambiguous answers about the ex essential nature of these objects. The answer to this question can be obtained in pilot studies enhancing their theoretical con uh, constructs. The question of obtaining artificial ball lightning from undirected paths forming a Mobius strip was studied in 1 and 2. The purpose of this paper is continuation of previous studies and explanation of the results obtained on the basis of the developed world electrodynamic approach. Right, well, uh, these are the images that you saw in the cover slide. Uh, these are probably the best copies of them. Uh, interestingly, you can see down in this bottom one, there seems to be the main ball lightning, but there seems to be also lobes. Are there, th there seems to be two lobes here, but are there more lobes below, possibly, or are they uh, coming towards the camera? I don't know, um, but, uh, and th this is our so-called zero albedo one. So black and gray ball lightning objects appear uh, below right. So we've got a gray one here, black and a gray one. And Ken Shoulders talk about white evos, black evos and gray, gray evos. So you can see, and he says that they are the same thing as ball lightning. And this was uh, International Journal of Unconventional Electromagnetics and Plasmas, uh, New Delhi, India. So maybe you can find that. This is from June 2012. Okay, all right. So they actually did some uh, some processing on this photometric processing, and they uh, see this uh, luminous spherical formation in the form of ball lightning with two tabs to the left, and the result of the photometric processing to the right. Okay, so uh, this is what we've got here, and this is the equivalent of the dark. So what they're saying is that, that there is structure within this luminous area. Uh, that they can get out of the photo and again we've got some sort of structure going on this uh, this layer here and something on the inside as well what you can work out right manufacturing man manufacturing te technology of mobius strips and how they connected with a power source and other details for the discharge experiments with mobius strips were given in details for the first time in one briefly they are as follows the basic construction for generation of ball lightning analogs is an electrical model of Mo Mobius strips. The design consists of flat dielectric base coated on one side with copper or aluminum, uh, aluminium. Model M Mobius strip one-sided. As the coating material were investigated also carbon, titanium, iron, nickel, zinc, gallium, zirconium, niobium, mo molybdenum, silver, cadmium, indium, uh, tin and tantalum, tungsten, lead and bismuth in the form of films deposited in vacuum or glued foils. Of these materials, the most well applied conductive metals are copper, aluminium and silver. So this is interesting. This is obviously what uh, was uh, most influential, though uh, John Hutchison never really tried silver, but uh, in the works of Tesla, he mostly used uh, copper, aluminium, and silver, and he found that silver produced very uh, silver and copper produced very dirty etheric matter, and so he stuck with aluminium and lighter elements in the form of bismuth and magnesium. As dielectric base were used, uh, dielectrics of both organic and inorganic origin, such as glass, for gluing of foils were used. Uh, they used bonding adhesives of organic origin as well as epoxy resins. Okay, now I'm going to skip from this to uh, the more original work um, because I've actually uh, highlighted that in more detail. So give me a second here. Okay, so I've, I've done a lot of notes on this. Now I'm going to do proper presentations when I've had time to organize it a little bit better but it's important that this gets out of the door ASAP okay because it's been sitting with us for quite some time and now um, that we, we've hit a little bit of a nothing's happening very quickly and uh, we need to talk about this and consider the data uh, in more detail okay so um, so in this one which is uh, in 1994 
uh, uh, this was published in 1994, using undirected paths in generation, ball lightning in the laboratory, application of orient orientation of the circuits in laboratory formation of ball lightning. Now, it is worth going through all of this. Uh, if you want me to, I will go through all of it. Um, uh, however, I've highlighted uh, several chunks here that I want to talk about, which are very key, uh, especially this little bit here and the um, importance of that and so forth. So you can recognize some of these uh, images as not very good examples of what we've already seen. So this is the black object that we've just seen and so forth. Okay, so by application of orientationless circuits. Now, what, what he's meaning by that is <laughs> um, when you have a Mobius strip and it's got a conductive thing and it goes round on itself and comes back on the other side, when you start putting power through it, it goes in both directions and meets on the other it, on the other side and comes back on itself. So it, it, ha it travels one way and it travels the other way and come, they, they phase into lock, as it were. Uh, the electromagnetic waves and I think that's absolutely critical and I'm going to speak to why you might need to do some modulation of that phase uh, um, or rather modulation of the frequency uh, in order to get the um, the uh, treatment of <clears throat> the uh, material done correctly because the th there's two real phases to this uh, two real two steps to this one you treat it first with high frequency electromagnetic uh, uh, signals and then you put a, a relatively high current uh, uh, low power uh, uh, th through it uh, low voltage through it and uh, supposedly that creates the effect okay so um, by application of orientless circuits they're obtained spheroids of two types at atmospheric conditions. Spheroids of the first type were luminous with radial about two with a radius of about two to three centimeters and a lifetime of up to three, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Spheroids of the second type were black of the same diameter, uh, but a, a lifetime much longer than spheroids of the first type. And this will be very interesting when you hear how much longer. The methods of obtaining these objects and corresponding effects are under consideration. The paper one discover, discovers some, sorry, discusses some features of obtaining luminous objects, conventionally named APO, artificial plasmoid objects, although the plasma nature of the object has not yet been proven. However, many experimental facts support this conclusion. At the same time, the work in number two, uh, reference two, proves the possibility of obtaining luminous objects of completely unusual shapes. And the work in reference three describes the production of extremely long-lived grey and black lob objects, as well as faintly luminous objects in the form of a pseudosphere. In the overview report reference four, along with many previously known experimental data obtained by the author, the results of processing a photographic image of unusually luminous spherical object with two protrusions, as well as the possible structure of luminous and black objects, and the explanation of their properties. These and many other experimental data obtained from the generation of uh, artificial plasmoid objects by un undirected contours. Um, now, this may not be the correct translation, so we'll call this uh, Mobius strips, uh, may be of some interest in the modeling of ball lightning in laboratory conditions. This uh, uh, was first mentioned, as far as the author knows, in five inexplicable from the point of view of the usual electrodynamic properties of the complete absence of reactive resistance in the Mobius strip as an element of electrical uh, the chains, sorry, it's bad translation, and this is why we need better translations, are surprising uh, and need to be thoroughly checked. Geometric features of the Mobius strip in the form of Mobius leaf gives an answer to many of the uh, features of the behavior and structure of uh, anomalous artificial plasmoid objects. Also, how it will be shown below, uh, these NDTs have very unusual properties acting as uh, element of an electrical circuit and with force excitation stable uh, artificial plasmoid object generators. The basic design of the NDT for obtaining these APOs is the Mobius sheet model. So the Mobius sheet is the model uh, 
uh, for uh, creating the uh, artificial plasmoid uh, artificial plasmoid object. Okay, so the design consists of a flat dielectric base coated on one side along the entire length with typically copper or aluminium uh, and typically one-sided. Carbon, titanium and the other elements as we discussed were also used with organic uh, substrates or in, and uh, uh, glue as we discussed earlier. As a material for the dielectric base, uh, they use glass, lavsan, organic glass, fluoroplastic, vinyl plastic, triacetate, epoxy resins in the form of a film or sheets of small thickness. So, you know, uh, you can choose what you want there. Um, uh, there's a wide selection to go. Uh, uh, David is currently using Kapton uh, tape or film. The material uh, for them was organic glass or vinyl plastic. Of the inorganic dielectrics glasses, so they spe specify the type of glasses used and uh, these ones here. For gluing a thin layers of dielectric, they used uh, this particular types of glue and almost exclusively this glue number 88 uh, as it is very plastic and gives a strong seam. So basically they're asking for something um, uh, that is able to be bent because obviously you're taking this strip, you're putting this metal on it, so you've put, got your dielectric, your, your, let's say your capped on tape, you're putting your metal on it and then you're bonding it to it. You want it to bond to it well but it, to be flexible so you can put it into Mobius strips. Okay. Uh, blanks were first made of dielectric and metal foil. Workpieces made of dielectric by two millimeters wide uh, uh, and twice as short as the metal foil blank. So I guess they are. So the the dielectric was wider than the metal foil. So you have a, a bit on the outside, and you'll see this in photos uh, by Dave either today or in the coming days. So uh, technology of manufacturing uh, from a thin dielectric workpieces are most available for re reproduction in the laboratory one of the ends of the dielectric cavity sorry one of the, of the dielectric thing was rotated relative to the other clockwise or, or counterclockwise by 2 pi uh, at clockwise rotation received a left screw nk counterclockwise right screw then without modification the twist positions brought the ends of the strips together and glued them uh, together with the like the metal metal overlapping and then next glued the metal conductor. Okay, so in the case of vacuum spraying, the thickness of the film applied to uh, the Mobius strip or the generator uh, shall not exceed 800 to 1000 nanometers. Okay, so uh, 0.8 to 1 micron. With chemical metallization, the thickness of the film can reach 1 to 3 micrometers. Maximum thickness uh, for the glued foil is 50 micrometers, so you need to have I guess pretty thin foil um, for the rotation of the the the, the uh, subject uh, with simultaneous electrical excitation and uh, current conductive. So okay, they are saying that it's important uh, to actually work with these parameters. A device whose design has not changed significantly in sub subsequent years. So they 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 refined the device and it seems to work pretty much every time. Well, not every time, but they they do actually discuss how often it works. Okay, so uh, it is a knot made of dielectric and metal parts uh, fixed in a hole in the center of the ND strip in place uh, dielectric base glue. God, that's terrible translation, so it definitely needs it. Okay, so I've highlighted this for some reason. Before the NDT was included as a load in the power chain, its so-called training was carried out or treatment with high frequency current. Depending on the desired parameters obtained by the uh, uh, artificial plasmoid object, the, uh, the current and frequency w was from 2 to 10 megahertz. So they, are, they have a different treatment to achieve different parameters for the uh, uh, um, artificial plasmoid object. The, I'm going to call it an exotic vacuum object from now on, EVO. EVO, EVO. Right, okay. Uh, sinusoidal or pulse voltage on the, the thing up to 10 vo volts modulation of the possible signal then RF current generator was uh, turned off and the NDT was prepared in this way that was prepared in this way was included in the power target with parameters 220 volts 50 Hertz 6 to 10 amps so they first treated it with 
sinusoidal or pulse voltages uh, up to 10 volts, uh, but with the frequency from 2 to 10 megahertz. Yeah. And then after that, once it was treated for a period of time, they then uh, had this power pulse on there to create the actual uh, effect. Now, this device, which it, we must get a better image of, uh, says an NDT rotation unit with simultaneous supply of electric current to it. The contour of the rotating, it's just not clear. But I poten potentially, it, uh, is there one of these devices spinning around or are they just saying that the device spins the, does a torsion field on the environment? I don't know because I can't see from this image, okay? It's uh, 220 volts, 50 hertz, 6 to 10 amps, Dan Moretti. Yeah? Okay, so the switching schemes can be single phase, figure two, like this. This is single phase. And it, it, it's confusing until you see a picture and then it's kind of obvious. So this is our metal foil and this is the dielectric like capped on tape or some polymer or the glass film or whatever. And I guess this is the glue here. So um, that's kind of what you're seeing there. And then it's attached on top and bottom, which is effectively <laughs> the same loop. <laughs> it's kind of like a short circuit, but a bit weird because it goes round both ways type thing. Um, uh, and multi-phase. So this is a means uh, where you can attach a multi-phase uh, sort of setup to it. One of the first simplest installations for generating an APO was a wooden frame on which mounted a rack with an NC holder uh, like a closed pin. So literally like 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 a closed peg type thing. An electric one with uh, <laughs> electric contact was brought to the holder uh, via a fused system. During the supply of current from this high uh, current but uh, relatively low voltage and, and 50 hertz object, um, there was an object photographed in a completely dark, sorry, the object was photographed in a completely darkened room with handheld shutter control. Now, I would like to hope that at some point uh, we can help Dave get to the point where he can start seeing these effects. But what they did is they typically put these in a, uh, a dark room and they used uh, shutter control to capture the events and they uh, then tried to uh, uh, do some photo processing on the uh, standard traditional wet film photography. Okay, now what I'm seeing from the Dimitri replication is that they are capturing some things in an illuminated room. Okay, now you kind of want to see what's going on, but that's not going to be ideal in certain circumstances. So, um, what I would like to get is to a situation where Dave is able to produce these to a certain degree and then I go and work with him with the super duper camera that we have and the high frame rates and put it in a darkened room and we're able to capture super high resolution, high spatial, high high time, uh, short time frame, frame sorry, uh, many frames per second with a large amount of dynamic range, this sort of uh, uh, 10 bit dynamic range on, on um, uh, video so that we were able to play around with that video and, and look into the plasmoids these uh, whatever they are the exotic vacuum objects that may or may not be formed okay so uh, so the first experiment showed that in the space around the main luminous body uh, separate from it at quite a distance uh, from its epicenter the discharge up to two meters there are phenomena resembling the origin of uh, the the production of uh, anomalous not anomalous um, uh, what is what is it called forgetting now evos I'm going to call them evos all right uh, and the process ends with a dull clap okay so photometric imaging processing of the discharge luminous area around uh, it made at Tomsk Polytechnic Institute uh, by Salnikov showed that the process resembled formation of a bubble with its subsequent collapse. As the experiments revealed in the near discharge spherical formations erode. So a bubble with its subsequent collapse. This would be fantastic to be able to capture on uh, high speed, high fidelity film. Uh, especially remarkable uh, is that the EVO with ledges, subsequent uh, photometric and computer image processing 
made it possible to establish the internal structure and distribution of luminosity within the formation along uh, the blackening curves. Oh, it's just terrible translation, sorry. Um, okay, so this is the moment of birth of an Evo, an Evo let's call it. Uh, this is the luminous one that you saw in uh, the other paper here, wherever it is. Here. So that is uh, that one, this one here, which you can see much better. Okay. Very interesting is the effect of the formation of luminous red caps around the working NDT with its force excitation. Now, in the work of Bogdanovich et al. at the Moscow Nuclear Physics Institute, they also saw white, grey and black zero albedo exotic vacuum objects, uh, mostly actually in the toroidal form. And this was in uh, water flow plasma discharge. DC bias, you've got shearing of the water, you've got shearing of the plasma, lots of things that are good for producing exotic vacuum objects because you've got lots of turbulence in there that allows for these structures to form to a degree. And so um, in, in, in their setup, um, but uh, uh, they also had these luminous red, and I've actually shared those in the past, where you had these kind of luminous red objects and different, different colors, actually. Uh, so the, lumi the luminous caps and the correct shape of, the, uh, of, of a hemisphere with a diameter of about one meter and double wall with a thickness of 3.5 meters. So this is almost like a double layer, but one meter hemisphere, radius hemisphere, uh, sorry, diameter hemisphere, so half, half a meter uh, radius hemisphere with a double wall thickness of three to five millimeters. Now we've seen in um, the Vega experiments a range of different uh, sized spheres and hemispheres and we have very clearly been able to see the double walls on those and uh, they have been like I say a range of scales but we've never seen something that's about like a half a meter uh, in uh, uh, radius and one meter in diameter so uh, this I would believe is another example of how we can assume that these things can be scale invariant uh, it's just a it's a fractal structure so uh, through the cap, the details of the, ins uh, of the basically the installation, the equipment that produced it, uh, were clearly visible along with the working NDT. The lifetime of each plasma cap is from uh, 30 to 40 seconds. Appearance in the atmosphere uh, discharge of such a large diameter is surprising, especially when you consider that the input voltage for breakdown such a layer of air is clearly not enough. Well, it's clearly not breaking down. Uh, uh, a one meter wide structure okay now if you uh, remember the aid uh, from the outbacks um, discussion on the ball lightnings that he has seen where he's seen them you know several meters or even house size a bit like in Hestalen there is this kind of like central thing that's got a lot of activity but there's this glow that goes out to a much greater distance and uh, this is very very uh, uh, correlated with what is being discussed here so uh, I would argue that yes they are producing ball lining in discharge experiments a light water effect was uh, observed which cons consisted in a sharp anisotropy that's uh, so an anisotropy is uh, where you have um, like sort of like <laughs> more one way than the other basically <laughs> you have like a, a squished thing uh, whatever okay um photographic and visual images obtained if the distance of two point uh, di of 2.5 meters from the center of the ndt was uh, placed a camera and next to it at a distance of 0.3 meters another identical to the first then when photographing the discharge the first basic camera recorded an integral picture of what was happening in time and the second did not even record a main discharge outbreak so basically they're saying like you know one one camera saw it and the other one didn't um, such a seemingly mysterious phenomena may uh, be uh, explained within the framework of class, class, classical optics assuming that the densities of media in the discharge region and observers are different okay 
So, uh, you know, it's actually changing the optics of the volume of the environment. And there's something that talks about later on about this. And of course, when you're talking about the Evos produced by Lockheed Martin pattern, they are creating coherent matter and the coherent matter is able to create uh, um, optics uh, and change optics of volume of space. It's described in their patent. So um, these are all the same sort of family of effects. Figure six shows an experimental setup for obtaining one of these uh, EVOs using one of these Mobius strips in a flask. More than 100 experiments were conducted. EVOs of red, orange and blue colors with a diameter of 80 to 100 millimeters were, were produced, I guess. Reproducibility of the phenomena is 70%. Uh, the uh, <laughs> these are the same things I think they're just bad translation all right so the 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 Mobius strip was enclosed in a glass flask of spe spherical shape made of glass of this brand and with a grinded throat and with a capacity of two liters uh, in the throat of the bulb uh, which was uh, the 300 millimeter throat long it was 300 millimeters long and 30 millimeters in diameter, there was inserted a rubber stopper with two holes parallel to each other. Two holes were passed through, uh, so I think these are two conductors were passed through the holes. Traverses bent at one end so that the contact clamp for the ND, for, for the uh, Mobius strip was formed. Um, the Mobius strip was held in a clamp with the rubber ring uh, and the spacer and safety ring were held in place. Uh, the, the Mobius strip was installed exactly in the center of the spherical part of the bulb. Preliminary radio frequency processing was carried out with a resonance transformer for one minute at a frequency of six megahertz. The frequency of uh, pulses, I guess, is 100 hertz. So uh, next, the uh, Mobius strip was uh, excited by a power current with parameters of 220 volts six amps and 50 hertz okay so i guess you can use an auto transformer uh, uh you know a variac to do this part of the work you have to use something a little bit more interesting to do this so you've got i guess pulses of uh six megahertz uh, uh for one minute okay so there we go so here's our mobius strip our um, generator. Uh, these are the two conductors going through. This is our glass bulb and so forth. Okay, all right. The EVO uh, created during discharge occurred and only when the Mobius strip did not break, break apart. <laughs> uh, I don't know which knocked out uh, by the shock wave along the cork of oh dear with the neck open the cork together with the and it, mobius strip should lie in the neck of the bulb and the mobius strip should not fall off the support i guess after the discharge the e exotic vacuum object quickly slipped along the neck of the bulb and hovered 100 to 150 millimeters from the throat uh, uh, cut of the bulb so Apparently, it came along here and, and came out here. Uh, da, 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 da. The Evos had usually the type of, they look like a ball of wool, consisting of tightly, wa wa tightly wound on top of each other, glowing light red color threads with a diameter of one millimeter. So, small sparks flew over the surface of the object at a height of several millimeters. Uh, and they went around the ball but did not touch the surface. The Evo usually existed for 20, 10 to 20 seconds and then quickly retracted inside the bulb to the working uh, um, Mobius strip. With the interaction of the Evo uh, and the Mobius strip, a discharge occurred and the Mobius strip was di destroyed. Uh, blue uh, exotic vacuum objects had the same surface structure but consisted of white threads and blue glowing mist above the surface. Observations were conducted uh, at a distance of 
uh, 25 centimeters from the exotic vacuum object and the objects could be well seen. It is noteworthy that weak thermal radiation was felt. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, it's difficult to work through this uh, translation, but anyway, we've done it. Uh, okay, so this, this is interesting. Uh, this was highly repeatable, it would seem. Uh, claims 70% uh, repeatability once you've got it right. The RF processing, I think, is absolutely critical. I think the, the form and structure of the uh, uh, choices of the metal strip and the, the bonding agent and the dielectric are critical. Um, and, you know, this is quite a large bulb, isn't it? So it's, uh, it's got a two, two litre volume. Um, and, uh, you know, there we go. In another series of experiments, small, uh, uh, small Mobius strips were made with a size of not more than 80 millimetres and a wall thickness of uh, three millimetres. And they were made of molybdenum glass. Uh, maybe this is, I don't know, non-destructive discharge tubes? I don't know, God. Tubular blanks were cut in height, strengthened in the flame of a burner, twisted and soldered at the junction of the ends of the workpiece. The diameter was soldered for manipulation with a blank of glass sticks and should not be more than the thickness of the blank NDT. Okay, so this is just showing another method uh, and they used a resonant transformer, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, at turning on the current on the outer part, the surface uh, uh, of the uh, Mobius strip appeared. Uh, many sparks, two to three millimeters long. Discharges occurred between small areas along the surface of the Mobius strip arranged approximately in a staggered manner. Okay, so this may be regular spacing, okay? After training with the power voltage, uh, after training, the power voltage of 220 volts, 6 amps, 50 hertz was connected with a power discharge that could be repeated repeatedly without any damage to the surface of the Mobius strip. The generation of bright exotic vacuum objects was observed it white or green spherical in shape with a diameter of 50 to 60 millimeters. Okay, so this is from a de device that, that uh, the size was not more than 80 millimeters and a wall thickness of uh, three millimeters. Uh, and they were generating uh, white gr uh, or green spherical uh, uh, EVOs with a diameter of 50 to 60 millimeters without a visible structure. Around the surface uh, uh, of the um, Mobius strip, <laughs> after each discharge, the, there developed a blue-green glow. But inside the funnel-shaped cavities of um, the Mobius strip, there was no glow. Okay, so uh, the glow slowly faded in 10 to 15 seconds. Such experiments... So I can say that, you know, when, when the technique to do this work is... Uh, um, you know, developed, we're going to see some really, really crazy things being, uh, and you're going to see more as we, we, we come through this paper. Really, really crazy uh, observations. Such experiments are carried out on Mobius strips of, di uh, of different types, in, and in all cases, the complete reproducibility of the described phenomena were observed. Okay, that's really, really important. That's science when you repeat things, right? So the parameters of the obtained uh, EVOs directly depended on the parameters of RF processing. Right, so if you don't get it right, you don't get anything. If you get it right, you'll get something and you'll pr predictably get that same thing if no parameters are changed. And if you change the parameters of the RF processing, you will get different outcomes. The uh, Mobius strip was in, uh, supplied with a sinusoidal current of high frequency amplitude from 0.1 to 10 volts and more the frequency was changed to 10 megahertz or more okay modulation was allowed okay right this i believe is very very important and i'm going to break out from my thinking about why that is important to another slide from this presentation so i'm just going to kill my mugshot there and what i'm going to talk about here then is this um in a sound analog, which we know does the same thing from various systems, uh, from Cladoff through uh, Ralcar and, uh, you know, um, Leclerc and so forth. 
sound definitely does this in, and in our ultra experiments you, if you have your ultrasonic horn up here and your stiff bass down here uh, you are only going to get a standing wave uh, where you get the phase conjugation where the where the wave is emitted from here and it bounces off here like uh, exactly sort of 180 degrees out of phase so it's kind of like reflecting up back on itself and it's forming these nodes uh, on which you get the yin yangs forming this is only th this is easier to uh, tune because you are using sound and the distances are observable but when you're using electromagnetic uh, waves traveling around this Mobius strip it may be harder to get the precise phase conjugation between the parts that are going one way around the strip and the other one that's going around the other way part, part of the strip so that then they can phase conjugate coming back on themselves yes okay so uh, this is it's a little bit weird to think about it but you know so it's going out round and coming back on itself okay but it's 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 rotated anyway they talk about it later but you 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 don't want to get those uh, you want to get those phases uh, conjugating when they come back on themselves or they cross over themselves so that you end up with these uh, nodes uh, that you are seeing here and that allows in my view for the uh, um, the production of the monopoles in those nodes and this is discussed by um, uh, by uh, um, who should I say uh, Tom Bearden in his book now in my meeting uh, with the German group uh, where I, I think it was on the 6th of January 2018 I picked out a sample, a John Hutchison sample and I, using my understanding of some work that was done in the 1950s uh, in a British uh, British uh, university and published in New, New Scientist in 1963 um, where they used a piece of quartz and a, um, a microwave magnetron and they showed that the piezo material of the quartz could convert the sound sorry the the electromagnetic wave into a phonon that can then uh, travel through and come back and give little uh, bursts of the same frequency converting it from the lattice vibrations uh, into back into electromagnetic waves again transducing using the piezoelectric material um, they were talking about getting uh, the um, the uh, the vibration in phonons at the same kind of uh, distance as the uh, interatomic distance and so I was describing when I took that video that if you had a piezo material on the outside of that aluminium block and it was transducing the electromagnetic waves from megahertz uh, or gigahertz rather signals uh, from you know microwave or whatever into uh, the aluminium phonons you could end up with standing waves in there that were at the same interatomic spacing or regular integer intervals of it or even just one along the whole length you know so you had it in the middle or two thirds uh, along and you could end up with two big like one node or or two nodes um, uh, you could end up with a situation where you could end up with coherence at that point and this phase conjugation that, that that's talked about by Tom Bearden and I said that that may be a way that the uh, superconducting, super coherent or whatever uh, process of the Hutchison effect occurs. Subsequent to that, the uh, US Navy uh, patent by, um, uh, what's his name, Salvatore Pai came out and they said coating a piece of aluminum, uh, aluminium with PZT, which is a, tran uh, which is a uh, transducer is a piezoelectric material putting a solenoid around it and putting uh, you know frequencies and pulses through that solenoid leads to um, uh, room temperature superconductivity in that and higher and in that aluminium block and this is related to the other Salvatore Pi patents now whilst they published it after I said what I said 
they supposedly had submitted it before uh, I said it. But the, the problem in the Mobius strips is that to get resonance in there, um, you don't know, it's, it's not perfect. It's not so easy to configure as this is because the sound is like that it's much easier to get the just adjust the sound horn and you're going to get the phase conjugation a lot lot easier um so uh uh what what am i talking about here i'm trying to get to the point of um suggesting that if you modulate the rf that's going through there that by going up and down through some frequencies you are going to get a point where regardless of how you've constructed the Mobius strip you're going to get points where you are exactly in phase conjugation and now if you engineer you could precisely engineer it and you had a particular frequency and you knew the the you know the propagation speed of the electromagnetic wave down the the Mobius strip maybe you could you know not need the modulation but I think a little bit of modulation allows you some flexibility and this kind of flexibility is something that I've talked about in all kinds of different Lena uh, experiments. I talked about it in the uh, the redundancy or the how should we put it? It's it's fault tolerance of the uh, Amasa vibrator plates. It doesn't matter if they're not perfectly created because you've got waves moving around, sound waves moving around, and, and some of them will uh, produce nodes. And the same kind of thing actually is going on in the ultra experiments. And what, what I'm saying is that when you look at this resonant cavity, sorry, this cavity of the Vivreal uh, that we used, it is not round. And so if you've got sound going across it, then um, it's going to... So some of them will be in phase and some of them won't and also you've got sound coming from the bottom and you've got this slight raised sort of conical area here this is slightly higher than that so you're going to have areas in which there is phase conjugation going on within this um, device and so it's not surprising that you end up with having the yin yangs forming um, and uh, what are we going here okay so when I'm looking at this paper and it is saying that they are having some modulation, initially I thought it was uh, potentially modulating uh, the uh, power and it might be doing that. But I think probably uh, there was modulation going on with the frequency. Okay, does that kind of make sense? All right, I'm not following your comments because I've got a messed up setup here. Okay. So, uh, where were we? Not there. Mm -hmm. Give me a second. Right, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so the frequency was changed to 10 megahertz or more. Modulation was allowed. So I think this modulation <clears throat> uh, of the frequency or the voltage, I don't know, whatever. I think modulation of the frequency will allow better chance of hitting phase conjugation at least during some parts of the cycle um, then the power current was applied and the discharge was produced figure seven shows three photographs showing the effect of uh, the Mobius strip processing time on the parameters of uh, force excitation on the first picture from the left right uh, to right shows the discharge on the Mobius strip processed thir 30 processed for 30 seconds I guess with an RF current. In this case, the uh, Evo will, was not formed, uh, but the Mobius strip was destroyed. 
The second picture shows uh, the discharge on the Mobius strip, which has undergone uh, radio frequency processing for 60 seconds. At the same time the uh, ball lightning was formed, the Mobius strip was destroyed. The third image shows an attempt uh, for excitation of the um, uh, Mobius strip for 90 seconds or more. The discharge did not excite at all, but occurred. there was a, a breakdown between the supply electrode and the Mobius strip surface. Further ex extension of duration of the radio frequency processing led to uh, Mobius strip failures when they were excited by force. Okay, so um, what I believe is going on, uh, or what I hypothesize is going on, is that the treatment process is creating standing waves uh, from the phase conjugation this is uh, allowing uh, the monopoles to nucleate uh, at regular intervals. And I think that this uh, is in line with where they were saying the, there were these regular kind of like glowing bits coming off the uh, um, Mobius strip in, in staggered intervals. Those were where the, the, the yin-yangs, let's say, in, in the ultra sort of terminology, are forming they are they're getting the monopoles forming there and they are basically forming this superconducting uh, uh, coherent uh, state and then when you put the power pulse through then uh, you get the formation of the uh, exotic vacuum object that is my hypothesis as things stand and so it's very dependent on the frequency, the modulation, and the voltage. You've got 0.1 to 10 volts here, so that's two orders of magnitude there. <clears throat> and uh, you've got, uh, in this case, depending on the processing, you either don't see anything, you do see something, and it gets destroyed, or it just gets destroyed. Okay. And uh, again, we need to get better images of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, outputs okay now this I think is probably one of the most interesting here uh, an interesting effect was observed with the parallel inclusion of three Mobius strips arranged in a circle at an angle of 120 degrees from each other success su it, success in this work in this case depended on the right choice of radio frequency processing so in this case if these are producing like toroids and you produce one here and a one here and a one here you end up with a toroid of toroids okay um but uh it's very interesting the kind of effects that they observed with these kind of setups with force excitation some discharge delay was observed by industrial frequency current in time of half to one second oh it's just terrible translation then one 1.5 meters from the three uh, mobius strips a cloth appeared flat in cross section, uh, it blew flame and it was measuring one by one meters between between the Mobius strips and a and a purple ball between the Mobius strips. A purple ball appeared by cutting the flame at equal distance diameter. Right. So, as I imagine this, and I'm going to try and get a better description of this, you've got these three arranged around. You get this cloth in between, and then this ball gets formed equidistant between them and it uh, and this was about five millimeters so this is a focal point of the the three Mobius strips I mean this would literally look like magic I mean it literally would look like magic the whole structure glowed with a uniform light except for cloths of flame <clears throat> the edges of which pulsated with a frequency of one to two Hertz and had a reddish tinge. It should be noted that the category of such an original shape lasted 30 seconds in complete silence and ended with a loud clap in which all three Mobius strips were destroyed. Now this gets totally, totally crazy, right? So, an even more interesting phenomenon was observed with the sequential inclusion of three Mobius strips located at a circle, uh, in a circle, at an angle of 120 degrees from each other. So this is kind of similar setup as, uh, yes, a sheet, Gordon. I, I think, I, I, what, I, what I'm saying is I think between the three, the three, you've got one, two, three, if I'm looking from above, 
and my head's in the middle. My head would end up being the glowing object that occurred in the centre of this sheet that formed between the three. Okay. Again, this is a similar setup. After delaying the discharge for one to two seconds, a red transparent cap appeared size one metre. Inside the cap, covering the assembly of the Mobius strip, a second cap of pale blue colour with a sharp border, figure eight. Okay. Uh, the working assembly of the Mobius strip was clearly visible, although the internal cavity of the Mobius strip was filled with a pale blue, uh, with a pale something of blue opaque mist. Uh, the space between the two caps was clean and not uh, glowing. This condition lasted for about one minute. So this here is our one meter cap. So diameter one meter. Okay. Uh, and it has a, uh, a boundary here, uh, a double there. Okay. So uh, blah, blah, blah. A red is about one meter inside the cap. And then there was this second one here, here, which was, uh, well, which is a red cap here. Uh, two, cap of pale blue colour, this one here inside. And then three, one NDT, one, one uh, Mobius strip is con conventionally shown. So there's, there's three of these, but they're focusing on one. And out of this, funnel with spiral wound green rays. Okay. Then from the central area between the working uh, Mobius, strip, uh, Mobius strip and directly from the blue transparent bell so it, within that uh, with double walls and a glassy sheen stretched out its length from the center to the outside uh, it was estimated to be 120 millimeters and the diameter here 50 millimeters its base sank in a blue fog after that a green narrow beam appeared which slowly spiraled into the socket so this is, how should we put this? This is utterly crazy. It has 120 millimeters here, 50 millimeters here, and this is a spiral green thing going into the center here. Okay. And uh, like I say, this would really, really look like magic. Yes, Gordon, a sheet line, line, uh, lightning. After that, a green narrow beam appeared, which slowly spiralled into the socket. At this point, the socket began to oscillate with a frequency of 10 to the minus 2 hertz in parallel with the base of the oscillation. The total lifetime of such a spatial discharge is about two to two and a half minutes. Oh my. I would really, really love to capture that on film. <laughs> When studying the patterns of APO generation, uh, these uh, exotic vacuum object generation, attempts were made to find out the process of formation of the exotic vacuum object with the rotation of several uh, uh, these devices. So again, so th I think that this is a rotating rotating device up here, and they were able to feed power to it. This somehow this is a rotating device. You just can't see it. So it would be great, but one could imagine a way to do it. Okay. Attempts were made to find out the process of formation of the exotic vacuum objects with the rotation of several um, Mobius strips. Five Mobius strips were mounted on a special board uh, and switched on in parallel. So this is five. They were subjected to radio frequency processing with a frequency of 4 to 10 megahertz with an amplitude of 12 volts at load. And radio frequency current modulation. So this is current modulation of the radio frequency, not frequency modulation okay so this power modulation figure nine shows a photograph of the power discharge on the on one of the five mobius strips as a result the result is a photo of the power discharge oh god the, <laughs> the effect of the power current on the mobius strip formed a luminous central ball with luminous trajectories uh, flying particles from the surface conductor of the uh, the mobius strip low luminous 
one. Luminous. Okay, so these are a range of different things. And the, so there was a range of different things. Luminous, high luminous, and grey. But you can't see it in this image, which is a great shame. Okay. All right. Um, but it says, repeated experiments have shown that the exotic vacuum object did not disappear. Uh, they existed, apparently, for a very long time. After 24 and 48 hours, the black Evo not only continued uh, to live, but it moved slowly. So here we have another, another instance of one of these objects surviving for 48 hours, two days, right? Uh, and so, you know, we now have the, the uh, magnetic... Uh, monopole sort of changes of the iron 57 on uh, the uh, Roetzkiev work in the exploding foils and this is kind of an exploding foil to be fair in places um, <clears throat> and then you have the electromagnetic phantom is this black object an electromagnetic phantom or does it contain an electromagnetic phantom certainly it's of the same kind of order here and you have those plasmoids moving around on the surface in the Bogdanovich work. Uh, in their case, they were glowing, moving around for two days, but you know, it could have been longer. And I, when that work was shared, if you recall, I was told that when they were doing electron beam processing of a landing gear for military equipment uh, in America, they observed these things and they were lasting for much longer than two days. So depending on the parameter space, these uh, self-sustaining um, very stable exotic vacuum objects can live for a long time. But Ken Shoulder says, in theory, in a metal, they can live indefinitely. But uh, here we go, another sort of two day period here. Okay, so um, blah, blah, blah. After the preliminary RF processing of the exotic, uh, of the um, Mobius strip with a frequency of 10 megahertz, the APO had, com the ball lining had co a completely different appearance and structure. Although its lifetime was less than that of the black exotic vacuum object. Formation of the so-called cruciform exotic vacuum object under the effect of the power current is shown in figure 11. Well, it would be, but you can't see it. <laughs> okay. Right. To determine the conditions for the development of discharge... Okay, I'm going to step away for just a second because I want to talk about this. Uh... And if we can replicate this, I think this is spectacular. Uh, the reason being is that this brings together several concepts that I've talked about. This is meant to create monopoles. And you'll see it in Shek Paranoff's work. And we'll see it later. It produces a cone from the centre of the thing that creates a monopole. Okay, And the cone has a spiral thing going into the central point. Now, when I was reading the, the parameters of this, this 120 millimeters by 50 millimeters, I thought, that couldn't be. That really couldn't be. It couldn't be close to the Sothic triangle ratio, could it? And so in my 3D software, which probably was unnecessary, I created a, uh, an object. But before we go to that, I'm just going to refer you to the triangles and spirals uh, video that I did before um, where we had uh, on a Hutchison metal sample I argue that these are monopoles that are causing this twist and you have these triangular structures in here and we looked inside for instance this triangular structure and we see substructures that are these scalloped areas which we see on the ball lightning cut on the copper in Henk Uren's sample. Here we can see the triangle and I've argued that this because this is um, ferromagnetic uh, this produces a hard and you get breaks but aluminium goes to sort of jelly it's a more soft effect so the soft in this case it forms this soft cone where you've got that maybe this is the the focal point but this cone here and then uh, this is in the break area of a part of a line reactor. And you saw these triangles here. So I'm arguing that these triangles are caused by the monopole here, here and here. And that 
this sucks material or disrupts material and, uh, and changes it within this disruption area. But if you look down the head of, or rather down the, the cone from the top, like down this way, you would see a spiral. And like like these in this is in echo and this is in vega and we observed this in a number of different Hutchison samples and so forth okay so when I was uh, took took the uh, I, I was lucky enough uh, in Christmas 2020 to go to Karnak I took the liberty uh, as part, part, the reason really for my journey um, uh, to go and image some of these sothic triangles and here is one example and I particularly like this uh, because in this image it has several things going on one there is this person down here which people might know with the snake coming out of the head I don't particularly know but what we've got here is a chain now I've argued in my monopole clutch video uh, if I can go to that perhaps uh, if I haven't got the slide there, this one here, in my monopole clutch video, that the ank here um, is exactly the ratio of uh, the birdies, and this is the uh, sothic triangle going in here to the focal point of the monopole. And uh, according to the uh, Egyptian, the understanding of what it means, the ank from the uh, loop down is the key to all hidden knowledge. Okay. And so uh, here's some of these ball lightning creating these uh, birdies. Okay. So I'll just pull that out of the way. And so they have a, a strong beam pole of one type and they have um, uh, a soft pole uh, and what I'm looking at here in my view is a chain of uh, these structures uh, and these effectively could link round into a loop and that would effectively create a magnetic loop which would be part of creating your uh, toroid and depending on whether it's a north or south you would have you know a a group that would be a north structure and a, a cluster and then the other one would be a south structure so what I'm talking about is like this is our ank this is the the uh, from from the uh, loop down and that one of these comes along and it, it links together like that. The, the strong beam uh, links to the soft. So, so this, let's say this is um, south and that links to the soft north here. And that, I believe, is kind of what we are seeing here. You're just seeing a whole bunch of these things like, like kind of like that, like over there on that lady's head. <laughs> like that. Wow. <laughs> Oh dear, no, I'm not used to this camera. So like that, so it's kind of like that going up. You've got a whole bunch of them, right? And we saw that happening where in the plasma flow, sorry, in the synchrotron beam going into the conversion target, uh, going into, uh, put through a magnet, separating the north and mount south poles, we saw them joining up like that in the work of Bogdanovich et al. And I spoke about that in one of my CZ presentations, either from last year or the previous year. Okay, so th this is like effectively, let's say this is a north be north focused beam. This is the south. This is the north focused beam. This is the south. And only when you have the monopoles collected can you create these intense strings. And then you can imagine that goes around into a loop, and then those loops can then uh, form a toroidal moment and the toroidal moment then can link together and so on and it clusters so forth okay but the ank is always associated with this sothic triangle and I have argued that the triangles that you are seeing here are kind of like the sothic triangle and maximally up to the golden ratio triangle 
Now, I'm saying maximally. I don't know whether it goes that far. Okay. However, if I go to a zoom up of this, and I have this in beautiful quality, uh, this actually is the ratio. Uh, the height here is 120 millimeters, and this is 50 millimeters, or rather, it is the ratio of uh, 50 over 120. This is from Shaq Paranoff. Now, bearing in mind, he is assessing this from a photograph. Okay? And so, it literally, when I saw that, I thought, yeah, that kind of looks a bit like a Sothic triangle type ratio. So I did the, the modeling and it came out like this. And look how close it is to the Sothic ratio, where you have a side here that's five and a side here that is nine. Okay? Five ninths. Five ninths. Okay? And the golden ratio here. Um, now, I'm saying maximally, I haven't seen anything bigger than the golden ratio. The Sothic triangle is effectively extremely close. Now, given the fact that in this work, it's going into something that he can't see the center point of, um, uh, you, you know, he could be a little bit off. And he only has to be a little bit off, uh, and he ends up with the Sothic ratio. And the Sothic ratio here is the thing that's coming out of this base here, as I was saying with the monopole clutch here. Okay, the, the monopole clutch here. So somewhere up here is the central point here, the focal point of the, the magnet, magnetic core of the exotic vacuum object. Okay. So, um, now, my initial sketch, which was mostly derived from looking at the marks on the lion sample before I really was anywhere near John Hutchison, <laughs> this is from 2017, uh, was this. And I, I sketched this from, from the structure um, <clears throat> of, John, uh, uh, of the marks. It's actually the symbol that's part of my remote view. And you know the history where we went through this from Hutchison's work and then this from uh, Hank Urian's work and then this led to the understanding that there was this. And I had hypothesized, to be fair, that this was, you know, EMEM uh, -E or E-H-E-H-E-H, -E -E like a sequence, but it actually isn't. By the time you get to the magnetic loop, this is not electric anymore. This, this is a, a first order toroidal moment, okay? And Dubovic works with Shishkin and they co-author papers now. So it's it's very, very exact. When they say uh, magneto-toro electrical radiation and magneto-toro electrical clusters, they are very, very, very precise in choosing that terminology. <laughs> it's not by coincidence. Okay, so I, I was very close to, to, to understanding it, at least as close as was being understood by Zverblis and Nevesky back in 1993 and 95. Okay, so um, what I'm saying is that coming, this is spiraling into, so what he's describing is that there's something spiraling into here. And this would be uh, equivalent, in my view, to the spiraling in of this spin isotope material here. Can you see that? Can I, am I showing that? Yes. This is a spin isotope material. Okay, because this is brass, uh, which is uh, which has copper in it. So, and and also 4.11% uh, of the zinc is a spin isotope. So this is spinning in. Um, this is spinning in. Uh, it's only nickel 61, but anyway, uh, there's electrons involved and so forth. But uh, um, you 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 have this spinning in, and so. Um, that is what I think correlates to this uh, spinning in, however it's going into the center here. So this is a compression system. This is a monopole system. Uh, and so I agree with kind of their later observations that you'll see here in a minute. Uh, and when, when this comes down to the synthesis basis, uh, I have talked here uh, about uh, the work of um, uh, S. V. Adamenko, and in his 2005 newspaper article that I referred to here, 
uh, and this is in his pattern, I think from 2003. He says that this is an iron sphere which is hollow and that in this hollow area here, dark matter it, uh, causes the transmutation of the material. Now, I believe uh, that we're only seeing half of this and half of this might have blown off or, or, or whatever because maybe it's brittle. We've already seen these things break apart in ultra experiments. Um, the the part of this may actually be a hole in itself, i.e. part of the rest of the hemisphere here may actually be a hole. And why do I say that? Well, I'm arguing in the uh, ultra experiments that material is pushed through here, ordinary material is pushed through here because of the hydrodynamics of, of the toroid bubble that's moving around, but it helically pulls in dark matter into a central point here, okay? And the reaction occurs where the ordinary matter meets with the dark matter, okay? And you get electron capture or uh, nucleon exchange and so forth. Uh, and once the cluster is formed, it does funky, funky business, okay? And when this breaks down, you get from the pole where the dark matter came in, you have this intense pressure of, of like quarks and and you know it's 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 com completely coherent matter in here but you have a shell and the path of least resistance is the hole through which the the dark matter came in okay because as it gets to the to to the central core there's going to be an increasing density so there will be at some point an area where um ordinary matter ceases to exist and 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 it becomes like an I think uh, Adaminko refers to it as a, an electro-nuclear macular cluster, okay? So um, I think in part that is why you see, uh, if I go to it, um, let's pull it up, no not that one, Windows, uh, you see this disappearing into the sphere, okay? You're seeing this disappear into a sphere, okay? And uh, the uh, in the case of uh, where are we here and we go here and we go monopole clutch in the case of the monopole clutch as as this comes in with potentially the sothic triangle uh, thing this is the point here at which ordinary matter ceases to exist and it becomes like th this is where the monopole is and you know we, we see the same thing in many many instances so you know we, we have a monopole in this structure here it ceases to exist i'm trying to find the the one by john hutchison have we got it here da, 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 da. yeah the, the, these were the ones that like this one down here so you you end up with a spherical zone um where the actual i mean it, it's it's can i zoom into that yeah i can you, you have this material coming in here and this is the spherical zone where nothing can exist in ordinary forms, okay? It's it's actually this hole. And we've seen this on Hutchison samples and, and so forth. Um, I'm just trying to find, do I actually have the Hutchison sample in here? No, I didn't, okay, all right, I'll bring it flat. Yeah, so in, in the analog of that would be here. This, this is in Bogdanovich's work, this is in Perovskikov. Um, this this is the zone where it's just a fuzzy ball. It would be would be nice if I had the Hutchison example because that would that's very clear. But anyway, uh, okay. So um, so what I'm saying is that there is a weak point where the density of the dark matter was so much that you have a hole on one side. And when the structure that forms the sphere uh, fails, the uh, coherent matter emerges and emerges as helium, beryllium which decays to helium and preferentially then carbon and then oxygen and so on, alpha conjugate nuclei predominantly. And so in this case, the iron crenelated microsphere uh, has an ejection and you have 
an ejection here and you can see we're getting carbon and oxygen uh, which is the predominant uh, materials coming out uh, those two together represent what 70 83 84 percent of the atoms coming out okay it's actually got this spray of carbon and stuff behind it carbon and oxygen here and in this case this spray here on this zinc oxide predominantly and copper oxide substrate is 97 98 percent carbon and oxygen with a little bit of sulfur okay so that is the predominant thing that comes out uh, so it is the flower of life it's it's producing i mean when you've got carbon and oxygen that's like o2 and co2 right you know this is these are the things you need for life right um for carbon-based life forms and i i would imagine it's the same on every other planet okay so it's spewing out this uh, carbon stuff and here we also seeing like uh, uh carbon uh, different samples here uh we've got carbon and oxygen in this case it is uh 80 nine, nearly 90 percent uh is that right yeah nearly 90 percent uh you've got some aluminium and some titanium interestingly we've got some titanium here uh again looking at a different part of these two discs sort of shaped funnel bits that come out come out um you've got again predominantly carbon and oxygen with some other elements here the titanium there and so on okay and this is by slobodan stankovic and uh it's nice that i like this one because uh, and we've seen this actually in in vega experiments i, I haven't dwelt on it too much but the, you can see there's this curved section here with this carbon plume coming out here uh, and you can see where he's analyzing it here carbon and oxygen re is representing uh 80 percent of the material that's spewing out of this single pole here and just for laughs uh there is this ancient aliens show series 18 episode 16 at 22 minutes where they put up a high altitude balloon and they thought they were some they they found these spherical thing like that they sampled with this uh sampling atmospheric balloon and they found under sem that it was belching out carbon nitrogen and oxygen from its pole right and they think that this is a sign of alien pansperma it's not alien pansperma this is an exotic vacuum object likely formed in the atmosphere quite likely formed by lightning and uh it's doing this okay and uh you know there we go it's just the mistakes that people can make because you can produce it in the lab you can produce it in the lab now what i would like to do i think we can learn something from I had this idea this is going into a blob that's in the center uh, and it, it kind of disappears into it that is the equivalent of something going in here and this the coherent matter is in the center the coherent matter this this dark matter in here is dark matter and ordinary matter and it becomes an electronuclear macula cluster it's, it's like ultra dense but it's not any real matter and then it ejects out through the port that it the material was focused into by the fractal toroidal moment of the fractal toroid um okay and so um i believe that the, and this is probably the best example we have that if you take the sphere here the center of this sphere and you draw a line out from the center of the sphere I suspect you might end up with something that like could be somewhere between what was observed by Jacques Paranoff and the Sothic triangle so the center here out there okay so I will do this and if there are other examples this is nearly good enough to do it although you know this is this is actually mostly you can see here in this case mostly silicon and uh, uh oxygen so this is this is not made of iron uh so it may be when when the coherent matter breaks down it's not quite so tough uh, and it's obviously not quite so magnetic because it's silicon <laughs> uh although it does have a little bit of iron in here so it's it's getting there um but maybe this is tougher and uh you, you know it has a, a finer um you know more difficult to break as we identified here 
okay? So it might be that at, as the intensity of the fractal toroidal moment and the density goes up, you get to iron and then this has a closer, uh, uh, you know, cone, whereas as it's a lighter element like this, it's, it's a softer cone. So this is a finer cone and this is a softer cone in aluminium, okay? So down here, you, maybe this is broader. So when you are creating something in um, the, uh, where should we put this? In this environment, uh, it's going to be quite soft, okay? So I, I, I don't know. So th th these are my thoughts. Um, and uh, I think that we could probably work out from, and, and it would be great if uh, we could get funds to uh, do more work with, you know, that, that Slobodan has done here. Uh, because we might be able to, he created a very large number of these things, but the problem is actually having an SEM and being able to do an assay of many thousands of examples and being able to determine that, yes, this is the Sothic triangle or something else. And if it is, then I think we can probably close the book that, yes, this is the magic of the monopole represented in uh, here. It is the key to all hidden knowledge. Obviously, the cruciform uh, that was uh, became the Christian symbol was a derivation of this. And the bit at the bottom here is the Sothic triangle. And the Sothic triangle is the cohering of chi energy, uh, relic neutrino condensates, uh, from the uh, cosmic condensate into the uh, magnetic core and... Uh, that's that. So I'm going to take a quick break here and I'm going to leave this wonderful image here for your uh, uh, consideration and I'm going to visit the boys room. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know if you've noticed that in this image, it appears that, I, I think, is this, uh, maybe maybe Stephen B. Halls can uh, let me know. I think this character over here, the bird head, is that actually Thoth? Um, I don't know, but it appears that he is holding a, a large ank in his hand. And for some reason, uh, he's kind of like got the, the, um, the bottom end, 
uh, is coming out. He's got the little bit over here. It's kind of disappearing behind the rock in this instance. And you've got the, the loop at the top here. Now, some people argue that this is a sonic device for softening stone. Um, I don't know whether that's true, um, but I would certainly suggest that uh, the if there's anything that could do it, a, a monopole and a the destruction beam of a monopole would be able to do that. Now, is is he directing this part uh, to the the target of what he's trying to soften? I don't know. Um, this actual rock, uh, this. Um, relief here at Karnak is kind of like on its own. It's actually put in a very prominent place, um, but uh, it's not uh, attached to the structure. Um, I just found it very, very interesting because of the arrangement of the the anks uh, were uh, as seen uh, in um, the Bogdanovich work uh, at the, the synchrotron. And also that in water, plasma, water flow plasma discharges, they also saw long strings uh, where they had glowing ends. And he argues that these are monopoles at the ends and that it is a string uh, between them. And, and this is what I would expect is going on. So, uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear that they knew exactly how this technology worked. Um, and uh, here we see uh, that the Sothic triangle is very, very close to that uh, estimated by Shekparanov. And if if the, the the central foggy disk was here and he was kind of measuring from the center, then the actual Sothic triangle comes from from you know the central point or from from the foggy disk. I don't know. It's, I think we're very, very close to understanding this uh, and only experiment will really clarify it okay so there we go all right now and i i think like i say a study of these things would lead us to be able to establish the conical uh, structure uh, wh whether it is of a very regular um sothic ratio um, or it's golden ratio, or it is um, the ratio of Shaq Paranoff. But like I say, I say again, it's so close that I think it's at least the Sothic ratio. Okay. Now, in other work, uh, which I think is relevant to just point out here, uh, the, this, uh, and I will do a blog on this, but this is a sprite. And if you look at it, um, you know, it looks a little bit like we understand here. And again, I think maybe by looking at this sprite and uh, knowing the distance between here and here and knowing that this is the central point of the monopole and uh, drawing that out, we should be able to work out the maximum ratio. Now, the thing is, this is even more soft. OK, and so it, it could be that the, the spiraling of a sophic ratio structure is still influencing material at a distance outside of it. So it's, it depends on whether you say whether it's completely clear here or whether it's in the red area or whether it's in this area here or out here. W what are we defining as the outer boundary of the cone? If we've got the outer boundary of the cone here, we're talking more golden ratio, like, and, and if we're talking about the inner clear boundary here, maybe we're talking more like the Sothic triangle, okay? Yeah, sorry, that that is an elf, you're right, yeah. Now, uh, he, here is a sprite, and this is interesting because we have almost like the edge of a torus either side here with material going in, and we've almost got like a helix going on here, okay? And in a schematic of a sprite, uh, they've chosen to subdivide this, and, you know, as we see in our fractal toroidal structure, um, they do subdivide. So this is on Henk Uren's, uh, the the copper that was overlaid on the brass and produced these, these various um, Evo splat marks and so forth, where it is sweeping the spin isotope through the material. And in here, you can very, very clearly see that you have uh, different Evo marks 
Uh, and typically they'll have two points in the middle. So you've got two points here, two points here. Uh, not so clear on that one. It doesn't necessarily have to have it, but there's two points here. There's two points here. And so you can imagine those are the two points of the, you've got two points here. But like it depends on whether it's self-contained yin yang or uh, like the, you can see it more like the yin yang there. Um, two points here, two points here, uh, two points here, two points here with a figure of eight around it, one overlaid on the other. Um, and so you can imagine that the spiral vortex comes out of here, which we, we've seen in, in many systems. OK, but, you know, this has got kind of six sides and you can imagine one here, one here, one here, one here, one here of they chose three and five in their experiments. Uh, this would be six. We've seen ones with five uh, in uh, other areas of Vega experiments. Uh, and on one side, you have this this is copper and stuff the spin materials moved over to one side um yeah it's, it's this experiment where you had a, a yin a macro yin and yang a large cluster and it swept the material through and of course all the isotopes of copper are spin so you get a lot of copper deposited here uh ripped out of the brass so you've got the brass color here and the color here but it's this area here this divided area here so you've got a macro spin here but then you've got the toroidal moment center line going up through here. The toroidal moment center line producing the overall cardioid mark on, on the metal. Okay. And so this actually is in this area here. I'm looking at this area here. So you can see these various uh, spots here in that area. Uh, and one very, very clear one is actually off to the side of this area here. You can see it here and it looks like this. And it's really, really focused in the center here where you can see it was sweeping material around it. And there are all different scales here. So and then I'll, I'll talk about this in reference to other work. But this is where exotic vacuum objects were launched in the Vega experiments and they hit the quartz anode sheath and they left these marks okay uh, and there's a several of those and you can see for instance if you can imagine that like this would be one pole it's not damaged the center at all in this case so this was probably a north pole um, but the the, the toroid would be here and this is the material swept around the outside and because it's pulling away from the center it's not actually damaged it uh, these ones which is dark in the center this would be like a south cluster and so you've got the, the evo here and the material swept around the outside and rammed into the center here okay and then just like the sprites that we just saw here we have this one's a six-sided you see this is probably a uh Sorry, this might be a north rather. I, I, I'm referring these to north. It's one or the other way around. Um, but here you've got one from the top, but here's one from the side. And you can see that it has the vortical uh, material coming in here. Now, the reason this tapers off in part is because if this is growing, the problem is that you can see that this is going out of focus. And that's because this is the curve of the cylinder of the quartz. So at, for, for this to be, stay constant at this uh, area here whilst this is starting to fall away you know that the cone is getting bigger okay uh, and so and it's just wet this is falling away so much that the cone intersection with this falling away quartz is getting smaller and smaller but at this point where it's intersecting you can see the, the spiral interaction here and that would be coming from the two points in the center of the evo uh, in the the vortex structure in the evo Okay. All right. And you're seeing the cross section through the Evo, like side on rather than top on. So that um, I think is kind of like you're seeing multiple ones here. And uh, here's, here's a, <clears throat> a sprite joined to uh, whatever you, it's meant to be called. <laughs> the other thing, a blue jet. So uh, you could imagine that, that, that this is a long macro structure and what one end is maybe a 
south pole, uh, intense south pole, and this is going up to a soft north pole, uh, and you have the, the beam between the two structures, maybe, I don't know, but I think we're going to be able to say with relative certainty before long what, what we are actually looking with with these earth light and these sprites and, and uh, whatever they call them, blue jets. Okay. All right. So um, that was a little aside. Now we're going to start talking a little bit more about the effects that uh, these uh, Shep Paranoff generators did. And you will see that they are essentially the same effects that, or several of the same effects that are observed in Lena and that are observed in um, uh, John Hutchison's effect. So give me a second and I will get that up for you. I'm going to read, read on as it were. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Uh, to determine the conditions for development of the discharge around the surface of the Mobius strip, a special experiment on the Mobius strip was installed. With 150 millimeters with a dimension 600 by 600 millimeters, preliminary RF processing was carried out as usual. After the supply of voltage to the Mobius strip, it was gradually removed from the rheostat, the variable re resistor mode. At the same time, the voltage reached the maximum uh, value of 220 volts and the current did not exceed 0.5 of an amp. At an angle of 45 degrees in the central cavity of the Mobius strip, directly from a funnel-shaped vortex was formed, consisting of black and grey threads. Again, a funnel-shaped vortex. The thread's spiral moved to the trumpet, tore it into pieces and flying uh, 100 to 150 millimetres, disappeared into the air. From all other angles, the vortex was not visible. At the same time of the formation of the vortex, the current and voltage on the devices standing in the uh, Mobius strip power circuit showed zero. And first, and first the voltage disappeared and then the current. So this effect was going on whilst there was effectively no, zero, uh, no, no current or voltage, ultimately. The potential difference between the conductors measured by another instrument showed zero. The voltage was removed, the wires were disconnected from the uh, Mobius strip. Resistance of the conductor on any section of the copper lead wire 120 millimeters long of the Mobius strip had an infinite value and a sharp boundary of the transition to a normal state. When the scheme was restored, the phenomenon continued. Plot with, uh, with infinite resistance increased at a rate of 2 to 3 millimeters per second after 30 minutes. After the conductors were removed and the circuit was restored, a voltage of 220 volts was applied to the uh, Mobius strip for a second time, discharged with evaporation of part of the conductive coating of the NDT. Okay, so really, really odd effects going on here. In this case, uh, the schematic di diagram of an NDT switching into a sound generator with a midpoint of output transformer was presented in figure 12. At a distance of six meters in a straight line from the Mobius strip, a camera was installed and photographed uh, the space for, uh, from the same point after each image in the frequency of the oscillator. Figure 13 shows photograph fragments of equipment. At frequency uh, of 50 hertz, there was no birefringence. At 400 hertz, central picture, the double refraction had the greatest magnitude. The bottom picture was taken at 1100 hertz on the, the Mobius strip and you can clearly see a region of space with a double refraction in this experiment. Visually observed dark spots of irregular shape as if hanging in space. In the photograph such spots are not registered. Right. Um, you can't really see things in, in this um, and I don't know whether they've got the three images. The three images are here. Um, and they're saying that th there's no change here. There's this double refraction here and uh, even more so here. You know, if sound's involved, maybe it's vibration. I would like to see the proper, um, you know, quality photos uh, to be able to make a proper judgment about that. Okay. All right. In another similar experiment, I'll move that over there. 
In another similar experiment, a phenomenon was recorded in which an optical image, uh, uh, the, the, with an optical image, the Mobius strip recorded uh, by the camera became completely vague. After secondary, uh, after the optical distance between the subject and the camera was decreased by two times. To analyze the results of experiments, consider the um, Mobius strip from a phenomenological standpoint. Mobius sheet and some physical effects associated with topological features when moving on its surface. In the works eight and nine, in the work eight, it is shown that when an object moves along the Mobius sheet, the object returns to the starting point after two full revolutions on the surface, as opposed to movement on a, the surface of a cylinder. Therefore, it can mean that the object passing through the point coaxial to the original undergoes inversion. This is clearly visible if you move a triple of vectors along the surface of the Mobius sheet. Therefore, it is possible to assume that the same thing will happen with an electromagnetic wave propagating along the surface of the Mobius leaf. And this comes to talking about what I'm uh, uh, referring to as getting phase conjugation. The topological quality of a double bypass Im Im imposes new conditions on the movement of the surface of the Mobius sheet. Electromagnetic inversion waves can be uh, considered as the formation of a qualitatively new transformed electromagnetic radiation possessing unusual properties for us. It can be assumed that uh, ele interaction of such radiation with the substance of the Mobius strip and its surrounding the space changes the permittivity and magnetic uh, constant in such a way that both parameters become less than zero. The vacuum permittivity and the magnetic constant becoming less than zero. Seriously? Uh, the substance and gas surrounding the Mobius strip can serve the source of the magnetic ser serve as a source of magnetic monopoles. And the area consisting of a mixture of ordinary gas and gas from magnetic monopoles. The prototype of ball lightning, or in our case, uh, exotic vacuum object. The interaction of magnetic monopoles is theoretically considered in reference 11. It shows that a magnetic monopole moving in matter polarizes the magnetic moments of the nuclei and matter becomes magnetic. This effect was experimentally discovered by the author in reference 4 and called the effect magnetization of non-magnetic materials. Hutchison effect does the same thing and we observed this kind of thing going on in the ends of Francesco Cellani's wire. So here, when, when was reference for? Has it got reference for? Did you include the references? Reference for. Shak Paranoff, I am experimental verification of the mechanism of generation of ball lightning by undirected contours. This is 1992. So whilst he thinks he uh, uh, discovered it, he didn't. John Hutchison discovered it and uh, it was a major part of one of the things that he discovered. So again, repeating, a magnetic monopole moving in matter polarizes the magnetic moments of the nuclei and matter becomes magnetic. This effect was uh, experimentally discovered by the author and, uh, the, the, and called magnetization of non-magnetic materials. So I have argued that when we are looking at the red and green uh, uh, hexagonal arrays um, or, uh, of those uh, blotches on, on the floodplain of the Vega Valley, like in this area, but somewhere over there, um, the red and green is polarization caused by intense localized magnetic fields that are left by the exotic vacuum objects of north and south uh, uh, um, type okay and uh, that is why I'm saying that they're red and green I've argued that in the past uh, I've also argued that the way light plays with strange radiation tracks may also be due to magnetization of the material but also uh, um, restructuring of the crystal uh, in there but I believe that why when you we, we could observe it with polarized light um, using the dynolite here, 
uh, on various different samples. You can observe it because of this interaction with the intense localized magnetic field that is generated or the changes in the polarization of the nuclei uh, in there as discussed here. So uh, I would I can only agree because um, he came up with the same conclusion I did. Uh, um, uh, but my conclusion was due to uh, observing how you can observe like these red and green blotches but before that uh, hypothesizing if this was a monopole and it's traveling through the material i could possibly use uh, polarized light to observe these things and, and it worked first time when i was looking at the tracks uh, coming out of a cavitation spot on a, uh, a, a roishan amaza vibrator plate so there there he's saying he's saying that this is what happens okay and it's due to uh the uh, uh sp the you know permittivity and, and magnetic constant um <clears throat> features okay figure four presents an experimental interaction curves of magnetized polymethyl uh, methacrylate that should have a H in it i guess um uh, with an external magnetic field in experiments there were also the glow of large volumes of space now this is also something that was observed in hutchison effects it's actually in the book of um, George Hathaway and I have an announcement to make today uh, as part of uh, some of the Kickstarter rewards for the book Mr. Possible we have five signed copies of George Hathaway's book uh, Mind Bending so that is one of the rewards I'm not going to tell you every reward today there's lots of really exciting rewards um, but that is one of the rewards Okay, and you can go and download the, the book as, uh, I think it's less than £10 as a digital copy, and you will see that he talks about, and there are photos of um, these large volumes of space in, in John Hutchinson's labs becoming uh, glowing and so forth. So anyway, which can be explained by the interaction of high energy particles with the atmosphere. Fair enough. Luminous shape areas can apparently be explained by this uh, magnetization of non-magnetic materials effect. In this regard, it is appropriate to make some observations in the role of this uh, magnetization of non-magnetic materials effect and the generation of anomalous, uh, uh, the, sorry, exotic vacuum objects in the laboratory uh, and in nature ball lightning. Right, now, when I'm reading this, luminous shapes can be apparently explained by the H&M effect in air. Uh, I would argue that this and, uh, where is it? Blah, 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 blah. Okay. If you recall, um, in a paper, I think it was in 2006 by Leonid Oretskiev and maybe, I think it was Oretskiev and maybe um, my Ukrainian uh, colleague, uh, what's his name? Ah, uh, anyway, that guy, <laughs> it's getting late now. Um, they argue that these magnetic monopoles are synthesized uh, by the back EMF of turbine four in Chernobyl and hypothesized by um, Shishkin as coming from uh, intense radiation flux from uh, gamma emitters. The combination of these produce these magnetic monopole structures and that they go and bind to the paramagnetic oxygen. I obviously was considering the 1996 work of Sundarason and Bokris, where they only saw the synthesis of iron and carbon arcs underwater if there was oxygen dissolved in the water, not nitrogen. And so oxygen, I believe, is key. And if the oxygen in the atmosphere is capturing these magnetic monopoles, that they will glow and and effectively that is again stated here by Shekparanov in this work and so uh, it's another uh, uh, correlation uh, you know <laughs> and so it, it is the same effect and and this is key in the Lenner process of carbon arcs underwater the importance of oxygen in there and um, the importance uh, it's because of these monopoles uh, structures that are synthesized okay so 
Uh, and it's also relative to what actually causes glow on the, on the far field of ball lightning. So the difference in the parameters of the attained uh, exotic vacuum objects suggests the idea that there is some factor driving these parameters initially. Consider the technology of obtaining the exotic vacuum object in RF processing time into the volume of NDT dielectric. Uh, uh, ambient space enters information about the order, order of distribution of currents, forms pulses, phases, etc. And recording is carried out. Information is uh, reproduced in the excited state of the uh, Mobius strip by the power current, depending on the quantity and quality of the recorded information that is uh, 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 the, the expressed by the different exotic vacuum objects. So essentially what they're saying is the processing of the Mobius strip then has a certain flux of torsion fields, let's say, around it, uh, uh, that when you give it a power pulse, it triggers a, a change in state of that overall structure that leads to the variation in um, exotic vacuum objects expressed. Uh, and th this this is very interesting because, uh, um, you know, Ken Shoulders was able to produce different things. John Hutchinson was able to produce different things. And uh, what I like about this technology is if we can get it right, um, we should be able to have a recipe for producing certain types of uh, um, uh, structures. And uh, anyway, th th there's lots to go on about uh, <laughs> what they call string atoms and, and, and these magnetic flux tubes and stuff. But we we'll talk about that in a totally different presentation because we have the evidence of that. And, uh, uh, you know, th these authors are very close, I think, to being theoretically correct. Anyway, um, so information is reproduced uh, when you give the power pulse effectively. Similar processes are possible apparently in natural conditions, since it is known that with the effects of linear lightning, ro rocks of the earth are remagnetized. Subsequent linear lightning strike, even in the distance or excitation another way, uh, uh, can lead to the formation of ball lightning. So what they're saying is that, that there are certain let's say torsion fields set up in the environment and when they're all configured in a certain way they will uh, be able to allow the manifestation of ball lightning on on a on a kind of more predictable basis um than, uh, than if it wasn't already the environment wasn't already set up now in Hestalen, there's like this sulfurous stream that comes out of a mine between two different types of metal slopes and, you know, there's there's quartz and, and, and you know, freeze thaw and all kinds of things going on there. So you could imagine that a scenario was set up where there was, you know, these fields there uh, that allowed for uh, a reg regular production of uh, uh, long-lived luminous objects. Okay, so they are measuring the uh, non-magnetic material being magnetized and so on, or the difference on that. Anyway. An experiment with the phenomenon of double refraction in the atmosphere is described above. It is known that double refraction in a substance is possible when the exposed to when exposed to a substance by an electric field large of large intensities. Uh, called, this is the Kerr effect or super strong magnetic fields, the cotton mouton effect. A quantitative qualitatively different explanation can be offered. Suppose that the uh, uh, vacuum permeability and uh, magnetic constants. Uh, of a substance synchrono synchronously synchronously and periodically change their sign then the beam of light passing through the volume of matter will begin to oscillate with some angle and so they got an equation there which probably didn't transfer well where uh, uh, theta phi, phi or whatever it is it is uh, the angle of um, incidence uh, and Oh God, I've got it. where this symbol. <laughs> God, I'm getting too tired now. Uh, is the angle of incidence of the beam, and this symbol is the angle of refraction of the beam. Uh, so on, blah 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 blah. blah. Environments uh, with uh, the different uh, um, vacuum permeability and different magnetic constant uh, is the dielectric and magnetic constant. Of, oh, it's the dielectric and magnetic constant of non-inverted medium. Uh, e1 and e mu2 is the dielectric and magnetic permeability of the inverted medium. Therefore, a double image occurs. 
As the experiment showed, the effect is frequency dependent and has a, a higher value at low frequencies, which agrees well with the theory. Blurring Im experiment images when photographing a working NDT can also be explained by changes in the um, uh, sigma and mu substances of the lenses. Right, so this might be, for instance, why you can't take photos of objects that are using uh, these uh, physical principles. Yeah, so uh, uh, that's that. And so this is the effect of magne magnetic monopole and radiation. Okay, so here we go. An analysis of results would be incomplete without mentioning one of the decisive evidence in factor of the work in reference 11. And this deals with the direct interaction of the magnetic monopoles, I guess, in contrast to the known interactions of the magnetic monopole with the nucleus occurs without the decay of the monopole. So I, I referred this in my CC presentation in 2020, I think, where I referred to this 1983 comment by an American professor where matter interacting with a monopole would be fundamentally changed, uh, but the monopole wouldn't. And so it could, can, it could interact with matter, a lot of matter. And this is ex exactly what is being said here by Shaq Paranoff. The protons of the nucleus uh, decay. In contrast to the known interactions of the magnetic monopole with the, with the nucleus, uh, with Oh, such a bad translation. Basically, when a magnetic monopole interacts with the proton, they decay. Uh, but the monopole does not. And that is exactly what that reference that I gave uh, previously had said. So this is a supporting comment on that uh, basis. Thus, the magnetic monopole plays the role of cat catalyst of nuclear processes. Naturally, the simplest experiment of this kind can be set with radioactive substances. So on the first point here, the monopole is able to cause nuclear reactions. Okay, that one. So this is Lena. Okay, naturally, the simplest experiment of this kind can be uh, observed with radioactive substances. In this case, the half-life of a radionuclide would change and the changes could be easily noticed. An experiment to test the effect of, of um, this uh, radiation on a radionuclide was carried out by this author. The results are presented in figure 15 and need no explanation. So have we got figure 15? Okay, so right. I'm not going to explain it because apparently it needs no. This is one, 131. Um, is that iodine 131? And uh, there's a decay, apparently. Uh, one to three effects on ampules number one and two by... Uh, this radiation. Okay, so basically, um, he's uh, essentially um, saying that um, this produces transmutation. It produces uh, decay of radioactive isotopes, both things observed by John Hutchison. It also produces luminous objects in free space, which was observed by John Hutchison. And it also uh, uh, produces um, visual distortions uh, observed by John Hutchison and also the uh, production of non-magnetic ma material becoming magnetic observed by John Hutchison. And so therefore, I am saying uh, that this is related to Lena and it is related to ball lightning. And for me, one of the most important things that has come out of this, uh, which when when uh, David Butlier sent me this paper, he was very, very excited about this and rightly so, uh, was this one of three uh, Mobius strips treated and then energized to produce this cone. And the cone has uh, a length of observable length of 120 um, and uh, 50 millimeters across and when I analyze this this turns out to be extremely close to the Sothic triangle which I believe is uh, related to the monopole and that is the key to all hidden technology and that that uh,
cause it, th this overall structure causes these triangles in Hutchison samples and in Lion Lenner samples and in Vega Lenner samples and in Echo samples um, with the spiral and that is the spiral that's going into the, the sample here into the monopole uh, that's in the center there and this is the same thing with the dark matter going in as discussed by uh, S.V. Adamenko and that leads to a weak point on a sphere where the material is synthesized in this ultra dense uh, dark matter infested spherical uh, uh, fractal toroidal uh, induced core magnetic core and in there the the material when it breaks down when the the confining structure the fractal toroid breaks down then uh, the material is ejected uh, through and becomes ordinary matter and uh, this can be seen in the work of Matsumoto it can be seen in the work of Hent Uren and myself and it can be seen in the work of Slobodan Stankovic and it can be seen in what was misinterpreted in my view this so-called ancient aliens uh, sample taken from the upper atmosphere spewing out material from the pole of its structure and I believe that by studying these samples here and looking at the diameter and the center point and going out to the edge of the uh, circular part of the cone that is spewing out this material we can learn whether it really is the Sothic triangle ratio here uh, and uh, you know uh, that's essentially uh, what I'm saying there so um, uh, this potentially gives us a pathway to producing uh, regular uh, and parameterized types of exotic vacuum objects on the macro scale that can be observed and recorded with modern cameras and uh, uh, um, with their time resolution and spatial resolution and a bit depth we should be able to greatly increase the understanding of these uh, some these structures and uh, 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 this I think will potentially be able to give us radiation generators uh, that are able to remediate nuclear waste uh, as well as do uh, transmutation and to understand what's going on in other systems like uh, such as uh, these kind of systems um, and by arranging as they did arranging a number of these around a central point you can learn how you know uh, clusters of these uh, actually produce certain effects but actually witness it on a macro scale okay so um, with that I'm going to put up an image and I'm going to just grab a few uh, images that uh, was uh, that have been generated by um, by uh, David from some of the work he's doing and you can you can get a better idea of, of what these things look like Firstly, I'll just uh, show you some of the work done by the authors that did their stuff. Uh, and so we're back to the paper we started with, which is by Dmitry Kolokolov. And So uh, he does a summary of some of the effects here, which is well to read. It led to the discovery of certain concomitant factors that were realized during the passage of current pulse through metallization of uh, the Mobius uh, strip and affected materials located near to the Mobius strip. Experiments have shown that this effect can manifest itself in the form of magnetization of non-magnetic materials. Hutchison effect, what we have observed in Chilani. Changes in the electrical conductivity of conductors. This is observed by Chilani. And it was observed uh, in, you know, I guess the Keshi effect uh, and other other uh, people. Um, changes in the properties of some chemical compositions. OK, uh, and this would be uh, because of the binding of the monopoles uh, into uh, magnetic and paramagnetic materials. A noticeable decrease in the amount of impurities in oil and petroleum products. They explain that, how that occurs in part of this paper, I think, or in other papers. Changes in the decay rate of radioactive elements observed by various authors uh, involved with Lena and uh, obviously by um, uh, Matsumoto, by, by um, 
oh dear, David Yerth, um, looking at Evos and so on, and their mixtures, as well as the action on biolog biological objects. Based on the results of the experiments in which the magnetization of non-magnetic materials was observed, as well as the interaction of this factor with the magnetic field, the author of the corresponding works, Iron Shek Paranoff, suggests that the observed factor is a flux of magnetic monopoles. And so they show these tracks, and these tracks are from other authors. This is from Shishkin himself, showing the uh, impact mark. I believe this impact mark could actually be a mm, south monopole, maybe. A south monopole is pu pushing the material into the surface, and you've got maybe the toroid on the outside here. Um, maybe. Uh, so you've got a depression here, and, and then a, a bit in the hole there in the center. Um, I think that was the interesting bit. Th these are their tapes. You can see how the Mobius strip is held. They've got literally a closed peg type set up here as described. Um, so it's relatively simple. And they're saying that they observed uh, this glowing object. They haven't had so much success. They have not really created long term uh, structures, but they are at the early part of their replication, replication process. In most cases, they saw uh, destruction of the tape and as we know from what Shek Paranoff said if you don't get the conditioning right that's something that can happen that, uh, that happens without the production of an exotic vacuum object structure here's here's a uh, setup where they uh, put the Mobius tape you can see this is quite clear they've got some PCB here probably with copper on the back and that is providing the contact and uh, you've got the electrical feed in here and then they've got some x-ray films here that they arranged around it and this was to observe the production of strange radiation and you can see here that each plate effectively um, you know they, they were observing strange radiation tracks on each plate okay so it does that so it was found uh, that in a photo emulsion of x-ray films located around a metallized Mobius tapes through which pulsed currents are passed tracks of strange radiation are obtained According to the model presented in reference 13, are atoms of filamentous dark matter, which we will talk about in the next presentation, most likely so-called fluxes. I have talked about these when it was referred to by Sabatomova a long time ago in terms of producing strange radiation tracks. I've talked about this before, but we're going to go into much more detail. Uh, and I think it's really key to some of the observations we have have observed in um, the vapor experiments may be responsible for the formation of these tracks. One should understand the word that flux, uh, taken in quotation marks, uh, is not a concept of flow, but is only a term denoting a cylindrical atom, similar to how the word quark denotes a certain uh, subatomic particle. A model of the existence of dark matter in the filamentous form uh, was proposed and substantiated by Rodinov. Sadly, he's died. Um, uh, by this model, the existing at the existing according to astrophysical dark matter which makes up most of the mass of the universe can exist in a filamentous form uh, this substitu substantiation of the possibility of the existence of matter in this form as well as the description of its properties is presented in reference 13 and 18 for further uh, presentation of this approach developed in this section it is sufficient to give a description of the elements of filamentous uh, matter in brief form so here we are we have yet another author that is saying it's monopoles and that we have dark matter involved so my own hypothesis the hypothesis of, of sv adamenko and here we have rodinath and uh, by extension this work by dimitri uh, uh, saying that it's uh, dark matter that's involved and of course uh, uh, we have uh, Alexander Parkmore saying uh, that dark matter and aggregation of dark matter is key or focusing of dark matter is key to this process. And naturally, one might think that it was due to uh, uh, neutrinos because of the beta decays and non-decay of uh, alpha isotopes. The element of filamentous matter or flux in the terminology of B.U. Rodinov is a cylindrical atom, the core of which is a quark gluon filaments stabilized by a magnetic flux quantum. And the electron shell is an electron Bose liquid. Yes, completely agreed. Fluidized bosonic fluid of electrons with the properties of superfluidity and superconductivity. Yes, we observe that. We have observed that in the, the structures that has to have formed the Vega Valley that you see over here on my, uh, what is actually my right shoulder, but probably looks like left to you. Um, uh, 
Calculations performed by B.U. Rodinoff in the quasi-classical appro uh, classical approximation allows to estimate the diameter of the flux, the magnetic field strength, magnetic induction, inside its quark nucleus, as well as the mass of the unit of flux length. These estimates are respectively, wait for it, the values of the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. Okay, so this is the... Mm, so the flux flux length yeah no sorry the first is the diameter of the flux 10 to the minus 15 meters so not very big diameter 10 to the 13 teslas 10 to the 13 teslas 10 to the 12 is oh that's a trillion teslas so this is 10 trillion teslas <gasps> eek <laughs> Okay, and 10 to the minus 10 uh, grams per meter. So uh, there we go. This is scary amounts of Teslas inside that flux. I can't imagine much would survive that. It is obvious that any dense substance of the usual atomic molecular composition will be absolutely permeable to objects with such parameters. The existence of stabilizing magnetic flux inside the flux uh, it allows us to conclude that the uh, that the places of rupture of the flux filament at its ends, magnetic poles are formed. At the ends of the chain, there are poles. Yeah? Considering that the length of the fragment of the flux thread can be quite uh, significant, these magnetic poles are perceived by the observer as solitary magnetic charges, a kind of analogue of a magnetic monopole. Let's assume that the tracks we observed on X-ray... So basically, you can go and look at this paper and he's going into how the uh, Mobius tape works. I'll include all these references. And they're saying basically um, that the, these magnetic fluxes from the environment are pulled around the tape and they they kind of like... Uh, I think I'm going to do this in, a, in another video which is a little bit more organised. But essentially, we are seeing... Uh, well, I'll, I'll read this bit. According to the model proposed by Rodinoff, under certain conditions, nuclear reactions can occur at the magnetic poles ends of the fluxes. So, at the ends of our fluxes, nuclear reactions can occur. As well as in the electron liquid, this Bose condensate of fluidized electrons on the side surfaces of the fluxes. So, uh, these tubes, right? and multinuclear reactions in the atomic ensembles surrounding the fluxes. Okay, So a, a distance away you get nuclear reactions. These interactions are possible in particular due to the capture by the magnetic field of fluxes, particles with non-zero magnetic dipole moment. Electrons, protons, neutrons, many atomic nuclei, atomics and <laughs> molecules and ions. Boom! That's exactly what I'm saying. That is what we have observed. This is spin nuclei get preferentially interacted with. And we literally see that. We literally see that in that brass sheet where you have the iron and it's at an angle. And you've got the two very large poles. And they are moving, shifting through a very fine thread, the copper, which is two spin nuclei. And, and, and basically, this is it. It's, it. It is exactly how it works. Okay? So, uh, you know, it, it, when you're on the right path, it doesn't matter whether you go forward or back in time. You do experiments, it will, it will show the same thing. And if you go backward in time and look at other people's experiments and conclusions, they're going to show the same thing. So, you know, that, that's what happens when you're getting close to the truth. And it's quite satisfying. It really is quite satisfying now. Um, and But you're, you're going to see the correlation between these things. Yes, it is, David Boutlier. Henry William Wallace Patton's ideas showing up again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, at the same time, there are quantum mechanical limitations for implementation of such reactions, the so-called localization barrier. For example, due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, an atomic nucleus with mass M can be localized on a flux electron shell with a diameter D only if the kinetic energy of this nucleus exceeds 2, M, uh, 2 over M uh, times H uh, over D squared, where H is Planck's constant, reference 18. By virtue of, listen to this, by virtue of the above, 
for the conducting of nuclear reactions on the surface of the flux, fluxes and the tangles of the, the same, the atomic nuclei of the substance surrounding it require an additional energy under certain conditions. The source of this energy can be, in the terms of Shak Paranoff, a power current pulse, the discharge circuit. So, this is what I believe is going on. Um, first, you are setting up a load of static electricity or monopole like tar charges, right? Okay. And those are aggregating and aggregating and aggregating. And they are saying that they are composed of these fluxes from the environment. Okay. Well, anyway, the static electricity. Okay. Now we know that we are creating superfluid, superconducting structures because they have exactly the hexagonal mesh and the uh, magnetic fluid structure that you would expect. And so that is what is definitely going on there, right? And so it's creating these uh, uh, macro structures of this kind of thing. Now, once they are set up in your conditioned strip, you then, bam, you hit it with the power. And what that does is, and this is what I'm saying about any kind of shock, this was critical to Piantelli's pattern. You set up the, the working environment and then you shock it. It doesn't matter whether you pulse a pressure, pulse the current, pulse an electrical whatever um uh, you have to shock it with light or whatever that additional energy you have to give it that initial shock and that allows the interaction of the nu nuclei that are surrounding these uh, fluxes uh, to go in and and interact with it and this uh, then causes uh, the breakdown if it's going in and then and the atoms are falling apart um then you're getting getting some so, so much bigger effect now if you go back to my uh, initial discussion on this uh on remote view have i actually got it here and no it's not there i was talking it was let me just get this um i was talking about vacuum polarization in lena and the hutchison effect and uh this is related to this uh, and you will see here now why. Um, essentially, uh, here you can see in um, from mind bending the Hutchison files. Uh, John Hutchison used a thousand volts per centimeter field. He built up static on everything. And this is literally what was the process. After several minutes to perhaps half an hour of filling the space and covering the equipment with electrostatic charge, John Hutchison would switch on the power to a high voltage transformer, which uh, to high voltage transformers, which would charge up several capacitors, some with an air spark, spark gap across them. These would discharge with a very loud bang and flash of light every 30 to 60 seconds, depending on the transformer rating and gap width. Right. At this point, I'm stating, it must be noted that static charge covering the equipment would imply a lot of static electricity. And I am minded to agree with Alexander Shishkin that this is in fact the same as exotic vacuum objects, EVOs, charge clusters. The direction, of, the direction of these into and accumulation in Hutchison effect target samples requires the samples to be placed below the charge cluster generators with respect to Earth on a non-conductive support. Typically, John uses a plywood or plastic crate with a piece of formica on it, often with additional pieces of tissue paper under the samples. Okay, so here we have carpet, plastic crate, formica, and then uh, we have... Uh, light samples on a piece of tissue paper, presumably so they don't shift about so easily because of lack of friction on the formica. And then you have a range of samples. Now we know that aluminium, which is effectively used by Shek Paranoff and was one of the chosen materials to be affected most, most by uh, um, and synthesized the most uh, etheric matter in uh, Tesla's work, uh, uh, that was 
greatly affected. Now, if you can imagine you have a block of aluminium on here, actually, actually I don't think any of these samples are aluminium, but if you did have a block of aluminium on here, the uh, charge clusters would go into the aluminium, they would go into the aluminium, build up, build up, build up, build up, build up. Now, John would then change and twiddle and, and affect the equipment around him, and this is setting up the the environment like like Shaq Paranoff is saying or like like uh, Dimitri is saying it's setting up the environment where a repeated outcome can occur okay and then he's giving it these big shocks and in uh, mind bending uh, George Hathaway is saying it took six to eight hours once the environment had uh, the samples had been completely bathed and, and loaded with electrostatic charge it took six to eight hours um, with these bangs going on and and uh, these uh, 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 John adjusting the knobs to to get the effects. Now these effects are the simpler effects are the ones that are recorded by Shuk Paranoff, uh, and but the more complex effects of uh, actually metal samples falling apart. These took the six to eight hours um, uh, to uh, occur. So uh, David is saying, hmm, I was using disruptive discharge spark gap for my RF generator for pre-treatment. Tesla hairpin, perhaps it's too abrupt. I think that's probably the case, David. I think uh, John Hutchison would load things up and condition things first before using the shock. Okay, And that is exactly what is being argued by Dimitri and what was actually done by Shrek Paranoff. So yes, don't want the disruptive discharge at, the, at this stage. You want to just basically build up the static electricity, which uh, uh, is referred to, uh, and I think accurately, uh, by uh, Shishkin as a form of, you know, basic little evos. And I think what you want to do is, in, in, in the conditioning, what you are doing is, the RF might be ionizing the environment. That is causing buildup of static. And if you get the phase modulation of, of, of the uh, treatment frequency and the, the pulse uh, duration nature of it correct, then you will get uh, um, standing waves in there. And at the standing waves, as he describes in one of his uh, examples, you get these little filaments coming out during the treatment process. So it's producing static within the volume, okay, within the environment. And the static is then guided to the standing waves that are created. And they probably will move around. Like if you don't change the frequency, you will get minima. And the minima are, when the minima are approaching standing wave nodes, they are the most likely places, okay? And depending, it might be like the, the uh, ultra experiment where there's sufficient variation in the path of the electromagnetic wave going you know two pi around the uh, uh the loop or whatever it is uh, two rotations around the loop there might be sufficient variation that there will always be staggered areas and this is observed by um uh solin in his work in just with an electric beam into a, a metal and the metal turns into a fluid and you get like a self-resonating cavity and so it automatically finds the point of phase conjugation. Uh, and, and so that is self-organizing. But I think it, it might just self-organize. And so these little spikes coming in are the what, what Solin calls the gravimagnetic rotors, the solitons of two types uh, of two magnetic charges. Okay, And they will be pulling in the respective fluxes of uh, 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 um, monopoles of, of static charge. Uh, and they, they will be going into those aggregation points, forming large ones. And then it's the extra shock that you give it that then gets those to all come out simultaneously, uh, which is essentially what you're saying is that they are in phase or, or rather you're energizing them with that shock. And they, they can then aggregate into a macro um, cluster. So uh, David saying, I'm just throwing S star star T against the wall with some educated guesses on the pre-treatment and hoping something sticks. I think that's all anyone can do, but I think if we do a proper appraisal and proper translations of, of the work that exists, uh, then I think we've got a much better chance of um, uh, achieving this. And, and once we start to get a working parameter space with like defined glues, defined substrates, defined thicknesses of tapes, uh, uh, um, 
pre-treatment, pre-treatment time, pre-treatment pulse width, pre-treatment modulation of phase, pre-treatment modulation of power uh, uh, based on uh, uh, initial power uh, and, and so on. And then the shock power. Uh, there's a quite a lot of parameters to work out there. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, this could be a really good way of studying uh, in a, in a methodical way the effects that are occurring in Hutchison and Lena on a, on a uh, more micro basis. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave an image up, and I'm going to uh, try and get the um, uh, some images of what. Uh, David has done uh, so far, which are mostly pictures of um, a <laughs> uh, uh, strips. Mm -hmm. So bear with me, talk amongst yourselves. If you want to start dropping questions down there in the timeline, then do so. Sorry, this is very messy. I'm sorry I don't have my equipment uh, organized today. That was a big faux pas on my point. Um, but anyway, it's better to do something than nothing. Time's running out for us all. It's going to literally blow you away when I show you how we know precisely that ball lightning caused these marks and the marks are exactly the structures that are being discussed here and we have it in such fidelity it's just like yeah dear really it's it's always impresses me how people can work from you know the maths and see things at very low fidelity and combine those two to come up with really good hypotheses that stand the test of time. It's, um, it's testament to their ingenuity and dogged determination. So just uh, to review for those guys that may or may not have seen quite a bit of this, uh, in relation to this effect, <clears throat> uh, things that John had observed previously and recorded um, that are also replicated with Shaparinov's work, long-lived luminous objects in space, visual aberrations, transmutation, magnetization of non-magnetic material, radionuclide re nuclide remediation, and uh, uh, the importance of the conductive nature of the material, and, and in particular aluminium, as previously identified by Nikola Tesla. Uh, additionally, I identified that witness marks on two kinds of Lyon and Hutchison samples and other materials 
that's seen in solen patterns. Um, filaments sometimes with seen or unseen bridges between locations in Lyon, Vega, Nova, Hutchison and Ultra experiments also seen in Bogdanovich and Matsumoto work and this is referring to these strings where you have a, a, a monopole at either end. A conical disruption in material uh, to a point in his and other Lena research and vortex interactions recorded in material from Vega and Ultra and in Matsumoto's work. So it's a wide range of effects that potentially the replication of Shek Paranoff can give us uh, visual direct access to. Um, So Corky, it's been quite a bit. Um, I think my machine's just frozen. I don't know if you're getting anything. Sorry, my machine, my machine just froze there for a second. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's been a bit messy, but uh, it's about getting this out the door at this stage. Um, we can finesse this uh, as hopefully people will be able to successfully replicate it. Um, but yeah, it's it's crazy that so many people for decades of being saying no one's replicated John Hutchison's work and there it was sitting in the literature all these years repli replicating exactly John Hutchison's effects <laughs> with ball lightning and monopoles like you know <laughs> okay so I, I got a bunch of stuff here uh, and I'm sorry, Dave, if it's not perfect. Uh, so, uh, you see, Dave uh, was using, if I actually switch to it. Apparently there's some buffering issues, I'm sorry. Don't know why that is, why I've done this. Don't know why. Anyway, hopefully it's going to record it. I'm recording it locally here anyway. Okay, so we have, um, I guess this is aluminium on capped on tape. Really? No data? Why would that be? So I have to thank uh, the person that gave me the chat. Uh, this will help. I'll probably throw that towards David. So Terran Art, thank you for the 100 Swiss francs. Uh, if David needs some materials, uh, we can get that to him. Okay. says it's got issues with the data. I don't know why. Anyway, I'm just going to go through these because I've got it recorded locally. So uh, there's a strip with capped on tape. I think it's aluminium foil on there. Uh, and uh, we've got a 
here. Um, here's a aluminium one. I think this is actually from Dimitri's, I think, experiment. Kolokanov. Again, here, yeah, this is from Kolokanov. This is Dave's. Uh, polycarbonate it looks like there with uh, aluminium insulation uh, aluminium sort of a uh, pipe tape Here is, a I guess, another look at this one, maybe from a different angle. So you can really see. And the interesting thing is that, of course, this is an infinity symbol, isn't it? <laughs> kind of, isn't it? Just goes round and round. It's also, by the way, a figure of eight. <laughs> oh, dear. I love it. Uh, polystyrene or polypropylene is that it okay all right and then I've got some others of yours which I will switch to we'll just go here for the minute I need to just break it out on the where are we mm -hmm. So Dave, maybe you can describe what you are seeing here in the chat. Um, I think you've got some capacitors here made out of uh, pet bottles. Is it right? <laughs> uh, sorry, that one. I think the Mobius strip is over on the far end there. Over by the garage door. Of course, you know, maybe the garage door here being a large chunk of metal is affecting the environment. Um, these are things that we need to identify whether they are actually a problem or not. We can certainly say that it would appear that some things went on when we were looking at the fractal toroids the before, so maybe that has an effect. So uh, Dave is saying, for those that can't see the chat, uh, this is uh, a crude but salt water capacitors. And here is a more close up on the business end. So there we go. That's the Mobius. I can see that that is on a Kapton, it would appear, that one. That's a more recent one that he's done. And uh, this again is this close up on one of these, things so you can see how it looks. So th the potential is that this is really quite simple um, to achieve if it achieves what we hope it will achieve. <laughs> and here we go, we've got a video here. I'll start that again. Running five amps through the strip. <laughs> well, I don't think that showed <laughs> that much. <laughs> uh, so the latest one is a copper one here. So uh, gain on Captain Tape. And uh, he's got this uh, 
You can see it there. They're producing the Mobius. Yeah, yeah, there are no effects. So um, actually, uh, I think probably there are some things that we can take away. I don't know if you can see me. Apparently the streaming is not good at the moment. So probably I'll be better off having a smaller window here. So the data rate's lower. So yeah, I would suggest that um, you have an isolated transformer for the conditioning. The reason being is that if you have any kind of like means for the uh, charge clusters to migrate to ground, uh, they probably will do. Um, I think that um, uh, you want to avoid uh, metallic areas around it uh, if you can. Um, certainly they're saying in their work that typically when one of these things went off that the uh, dome around them was about one meter in diameter and given the fact that they're also saying that the environment is conditioned during the pre-processing pre stage you wouldn't necessarily want things uh, uh, within that area that you could be conditioning as it were so I think you want to be okay so it was isolated David said it was isolated so I, I think the it needs to be isolated on the treatment but I think it, the treatment as we've identified I don't think you want any unidirectional pulses at that time I think you want phase conjugation uh, um, and uh, appropriate levels of pulses of the fr treatment frequency um, uh, at an amount of time of those pulses and an amount of voltage and an amount of frequency um, uh, to be determined based on the material and the environment that it's in. Uh, okay, actually only the pre-treat. Okay, so if, if the... It, oh, okay, that's interesting. So David is saying that the only the pre-treatment was isolated, in which case um, I would suggest that as soon as you connected it to the power phase you effectively drained all of the charge clusters from the structure so that also has to be isolated okay so pre-treatment was ac modulation that, that that okay um ac modulation at what frequency are we talking about the megahertz that they're talking about um or were you were you relying on the treatment with the uh, spark gap to produce the frequency. Anyway, so um, I think probably you're killing your pretreatment if the pre if the pretreatment was successful. I think you're probably killing it by having a grounded or or path to ground uh, power phase. Okay, all right. So so he's saying he's going to run it through a transformer next. All right, excellent. So yeah, the tes Tesla hairpin. So I think I think we need to in the in the pretreatment, you need to avoid. You need on and off, but you don't want the massive shock that you're going to get from a Tesla hairpin. Uh, uh, so I think you want to at least try it with just pure uh, electromagnetic RF uh, frequency rather than RF produced from a Tesla hairpin. Okay, I don't know if you have the equipment. Certainly, John has all of the equipment necessarily, <laughs> and then some. Um, so yeah, the copper coil and caps. Okay. All right, yeah, but then you've still got the problem with the spark gap. Okay, so I think we really, if we're going to replicate, we have to replicate, don't we? So it might be that once you've got everything right, working on the other end, that the spark gap might work. From my point of view, a spark gap, if the result of that is fed into the actual material you're going to have charge clusters going in there but are they being blown up at the same time as they're being put in there are they not allowed to get to a point you know a straight rf signal is going to be potentially doing some ionization of the air around it potentially producing some uh, uh, um, standing waves in there um yeah, maybe Scotty. Uh, I think you, uh, Scotty's probably in a good position to try this. Yeah, you need you need a good RF generator, and uh, probably uh, John Hutchison is the expert to use. And and I will remember that John said one of his key frequencies was one megahertz. Uh, so uh, 
you know, uh, is it one? I think they were using. Let's have a look again. What were they typically using? Shut the power off. Uh, I think 10 megahertz for the latter tests, weren't they? Yeah, 10 megahertz for the latter tests, but they were using less earlier on. But these are all within the range of uh, frequencies. Yeah, so one one minute at, six, uh, at a frequency of six megahertz. Yeah, so these are all kind of frequencies that John was using uh, in the phase where, so first he's loading everything up with mini charge clusters, uh, ACA static, static electricity. He's then um, organizing them uh, and giving them the extra punch. Uh, but ev in every case, it's isolated. The, the beauty of John's work is that everything is naturally isolated. You're, you're doing it all without actually contacting it. <laughs> um. Okay, so... Uh, do people want to go to a Zoom call? Are people able to do that? Because um, I think there's better better way to uh, do this chat part right now. So if, if anyone wants to go to a Zoom call, I'll just post a quick link uh, on the bottom of the blog for this at remote view. Uh, and then I think we'll have a better outcome. Uh, who's up for a who can participate in a Zoom? Let's ask that. <laughs> Daniel, it's an interesting concept you've got there, but uh, 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 Nancy Lazarin actually has a whole headset in her oracle room uh, at the Hutchison lab, uh, which is completely made of Mobius uh, <laughs> folded uh, uh, wires. I mean, it's not strictly Mo Mobius actually in this sense. So Ken Pratt can Zoom, thanks. I'll say good night to all. Stephen, thank you. Uh, so in review, uh, I believe that the Shaq Paranoff work uh, uh, is able to aggregate charge clusters, uh, static electricity or, or aggregate uh, small magnetic monopoles uh, from the environment and then a power pulse uh, allows it to create structures including monopoles that have a sothic triangle cone coming out of them as observed I believe uh, in various Lena and Hutchison samples and this is I believe the leading to the core of the magnetic monopole that does the um, nuclear reactions uh, from these filamentous things that maybe are bound into this core, um, focused by by the fractal toroidal moment, and uh, this leads to the spheres where nuclear eruptions come out of them. Okay, so Corky's going to try a new laptop. We'll see. Okay, so I'm g let me download Zoom. Okay, so what I will do is I'll have a waiting room, and I will invite people in that that say that they want to join. So for those that are um, on the Zoom, sorry, on the um, YouTube, uh, I'm going to sign off now. Uh, in fact, I might just do the Zoom right now, set it up and post the, the, the Zoom connection in uh, YouTube. Uh, but there will be a waiting room, so uh, you will have to. Uh, I will also, for those that want to dial in, I will put the dial-in codes on the blog as well. So let me set up a meeting and then we can have a quick thrash through and people can ask direct questions a little bit more fluidly. Right, um, so panel two.
Okay. I'm gonna drop this into a meeting like the looking granular there. No, I think I've got issues with the uh, Daniel, it's not you. It's it's it, it's the stream coming from here because I had to do an impromptu setup as I missed a piece of critical equipment, so that's why it was a bit of a, uh, a low, low grade technical presentation this time. Uh, but it gets us running for the year. Not a, not with a and I think with a bang with the actual content, but content is king rather than. presentation this t today <laughs> uh, right what am I doing I'm going to here and I'm going to post the links Windows. There we go. Okay, it's going on the comment. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give the Zoom meeting here, and I have phone numbers for those that want to join via phone. And then I will kill the stream. Okay. So, with that, I will say good night. Uh, that this was uh, Shaq Paranoff a generator uh, which I believe is effectively a replication of Hutchison and Lenner effects done in the 1980s in fact I think it was done even maybe before that um, but uh, certainly uh, there was reporting by the 1980s here and again we should expect standing wave phase conjugation resonant nodes to lead to structures that lead to uh, ball lightning which involve dark matter and stuff and uh, uh, glowy and non absolutely non glowy objects like we see there so thank you very much for your time and I'll see you hopefully in a few minutes in the zoom chat bye for now